Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the City Council study session of Tuesday, March 14th. I now call the meeting to order. Would everybody please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? <clears throat> Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag. We did this last meeting too. Okay, so um, so uh, Madam Clerk, would you please do the roll call? Councilmember Gamaros? Here. Councilmember Marr? Here. Councilmember Reynolds? Here. Councilmember Chavez? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Harlan? Here. Mayor Stevens? Here. And the record will reflect that Councilmember Harper is absent. Okay, excellent. So. Um, we're going to have our public comment now, um, and uh, the item that we're talking about today is the Public Works Department overview and the state grant projects. So as folks that uh, may uh, be paying attention would know, I mean, the Public Works Department overview is going to be uh, presumably our director, uh, Mr. Seth Rahman, and others are going to go over a PowerPoint that's going to give an overview of the department in general. And then the state grant projects are going to be the projects that are addressed by the grant of Dave Min, $10 million, um, and Cotty Petrie Norris, or Ketchum Libel Park, which is about $1.2 million. And then um, I can't remember the number, but it's a county grant from our supervisor, Katrina Foley, for two specific projects, the skate park expansion and the uh, cafe. So, um, and by the way, the MINS grant, um, not, not to blow the um, suspense, but it, it pertains to some very specific projects. And then in general, it's four different parks. One is Fairview Park, the other is Tewinkle Park, and then it's um, Shalimar Park, and um, not really a park, but Jack Hammett um, Sports Complex. The reason I'm giving you this is because now we're gonna go into public comment. And unlike public comment in a regular meeting where you could talk about anything except for the items that are on the agenda, public comment in a study session is only the item or items that are on the agenda. And uh, it doesn't look like we have a whole lot of folks here, so we'll do a three-minute comment. You can have three minutes. Uh, it's uh, five minutes if it's translated, and you're going to get a, a, a beep. You hear a sound uh, out two minutes, and then please wrap it up. If you're talking in the chambers, your microphone will um, cut off at three minutes. If you're talking on Zoom, we'll just do something to disrupt you, okay? So, um, and also it's study session, so everybody's gonna go by first name basis. I wanna welcome Baron, our counselor, who's taking over for Kim Barlow. Um, and so welcome to the dais. And uh, so let's do our public comment. Anybody? Okay, while our public commenters are, are um, coming up, I just wanna recognize and thank members of our PACS commission who are here, and they're gonna also deliberate in their meeting on the, pr on the projects that I just identified. Yes, you have the floor. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Oh, here, I gotta turn on your mic. <laughs> Give me a second. Oh, it's on, good. Hello, okay. Hi, Mr. Mayor and council. Um, my name's Stephanie, and this is Christina. Christina. Um, no, I actually wrote stuff down so I didn't get off topic. <laughs> um, we're here as neighbors of Brentwood Park, uh, Brentwood Park is a historic, heavily utilized park, but has been neglected in recent years and was initially identified in 2016 in the Parks and Rec Commission's report as a C rating, one of only two parks called out of Costa Mesa's 30 parks specifically called out for its outdated equipment. Brentwood has already been identified in this year's 2022-2023 budget, and we're here in hopes of being able to advocate for continued support and collaboration on this project. We put together a petition with over 350 signatures 
conducted a survey to receive community input on what the community hopes to achieve in terms of playground equipment. We have also put together a conceptual rendering based off of the community input survey results, along with drawings of a dream park imagined by local kindergartners in Costa Mesa. Their dream park included lots of climbing structures, slides, swings, and monkey bars. We have as a group collectively spent hundreds of hours over the past three years to see that Brentwood Park is updated with new play equipment for all of the surrounding families and their children. We have been so grateful for all the support Elizabeth Dorn Parker and Jeffrey Harlan have provided over these past years. Our hope is to continue moving this project forward for the community. We are asking for continued support and collaboration to see it through. Thank you. And oh, oh, we have some material also. Okay. We Leave it. Okay, you have plenty of time. We provided a history and background on Brentwood Park dating back as early as 2016 um, and landing us where we are here today in 2023 and some of the key milestones that the Parks Commission have identified with Brentwood needing to be updated. Uh, we've also provided for you the survey results and the 350 signed petition for the, from the community within Costa Mesa along with their corresponding addresses. We've also compiled the survey results um, and built a conceptual rendering of what the park could possibly look like based on that survey feedback. We are leaving this here for you guys to review and we really look forward to continuing to collaborate on this project and see it happen this year. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, wonderful. Yeah, you can provide those materials to the city clerk and she'll make sure we all get them. Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, I'm Andy Campbell. I'm uh, on the Fairview Park Steering Committee. I've, I've been chairing the committee for the past few years. And uh, we have seven very talented people on that committee with, that would like to give input onto capital improvement projects. And uh, that's part of our mission. And so there's a, a project on the uh, table tonight for discussion, which um, we have not seen. And I just wanted to render at least my opinion, um, not necessarily the committee's opinion. Um, there are experts in that collection of people. I'm a hydrogeologist. What that means in layman's term is I move water around to various uh, ponds and, and uh, properties. In my, in my day job, I manage about 1,000 acres of um, property that have about 40 different ponds on there, including wetlands, uh, recharge basins. Yeah, I've got a dozen pump stations, some of them are recirculating type pumps. And so the project on the consideration today as an alternate, I believe, is a recirculation pump for the wetlands in, um, in Fairview Park. And I don't believe that's really been given the amount of time and thought that it needs. There's uh, inherent problems with the pump station in a natural environment like that. Those pumps clog pretty regularly. You're gonna have constant electric bills. You'll have constant maintenance on there. But I think worst of all is you're recirculating water. Those trees are gonna consume the water. You're gonna have evaporation. And continuing to top off that water is gonna make that water saltier and saltier and saltier. Not necessarily in the first couple of years, but gradually. Um, that's gonna have a harmful effect on the habitat, on the wildlife, on the vegetation. And you're gonna get in a situation where you're gonna wanna flush it out. And then you're back to where you started. You're, you're back with water at the end, releasing it along the bluff, mosquito issues and perhaps an unhealthy environment. So I'd like that, at least that aspect, to be considered before we move forward on that. Um, so in, in rethinking that, I think for the purposes of the min money, I think it's too soon to really recommend that. And I'd like to see the council look more towards the bluff and the Mesa restorations. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Cynthia, before you go, can you wait? We don't have the ding you know, the audible at one minute. Can we turn that on? <laughs> it didn't work with Andy. Hi. Let's give it a try. You give yes, me, give yeah. me a warning at one minute. Well, I'll do, I'll do this. Okay. <laughs> good evening, council. It's good to see you all again. Um, I am also, uh, I'm Cynthia D'Agosta, I'm a Costa Mesa resident, a uh, previous staff member, um, and also on the Fairview Park Steering Committee currently. 
And I am here tonight, too, to echo what uh, Mr. Campbell has said, but also to um, make sure that you saw the submitted comments that we uh, sent in today um, and to encourage that there be more communication regarding the park grant money that we are receiving for Fairview Park before decisions are made. The Fairview Park Steering Committee has not had a deliberation on these projects yet, and we would like the opportunity to do that before decisions are made. But what I've submitted tonight is, are some comments also on two of the projects that are recommended, the restoration of the Mesa and Bluffs, which I wholeheartedly agree with. The, those have been waiting for restoration for a long, long time, and especially with these rains are in need of it again. Um, but how we go about that is the question, I think. And so I've offered some alternatives, and I think the same with the um, wetlands improvements, that uh, as, as Andy has said, uh, there's a lot more to the study and that needs to be done. I, I think that the uh, recirculation uh, pump is a grab and a, a Band-Aid fix, if you will, on, on the entire system and something that we need to look more carefully at before we spend a million dollars on it or any money on it. And then thirdly, I have offered that we should um, consider some of the projects that did not make tonight's list that are on the CIP Fairview Park list that have been on there for a long time. And in particular, uh, fencing, signage, and uh, trails, you know, trail improvements. Again, the park has been waiting for a long time to have just some general maintenance done, but also to upgrade uh, the fences and the signage for public enjoyment, for public education, and to meet some of our regulatory needs with our um, uh, habitats and endangered species that we have out there. Um, so again, I just encourage that we have an opportunity to have more discussion, more thorough discussion with, um, with both departments. We have talked to the Parks Department, but we'd like to have some discussions with the Engineering Department as well at the Fairview Park Steering Committee, and then perhaps be able to uh, come back and speak with some of you again regarding these projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the chambers wishes to speak at public comment? Um, I don't see anybody. How about on Zoom? Brenda, do we have anybody? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Hank Castanetti, please. One speaker. Hank, you have the floor. Good evening, City Council, uh, Costa Mesa residents. Um, Hank Castanetti. I am the Orange County Model Engineer Liaison to the Fairview Park Steering Committee. I've had the privilege to serve on this committee for over four years. The model engineers partner with the city to support the protection and enhancement of the native and endangered plants and animals in the park. We are excited to be a part of the rewriting of the Fairview Park Master Plan and always willing to provide assistance to staff on other capital and maintenance projects as they arise. The steering committee has a wealth of expertise among its members in the areas of hydrology, park planning, natural resource protection, native habitat restoration, and cultural resource protection, just to highlight a brief few. The scope of the steering committee's responsibilities is to advise the city council on a wide variety of issues affecting Fairview Park as a resource to be protected and preserved, and we have the bandwidth to assist in many ways. We are aware that city staff is stretched thin in many areas, and in the final analysis, we hope the city will recognize the steering committee as an adjunct and complement to staff efforts rather than an encumbrance. With all our available talent, we can help, and we hope the city will take advantage of our, our talent and expertise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hank. Anybody else? No further speakers, Mr. Okay, Mayor. so we'll, we'll close the uh, public comment, and so now, now we're gonna go right to the um, report, uh, beginning with Mr. Seth Rahman on the Public Works Department overview, but, uh, uh, maybe we'll have uh, the city manager kind of do a little intro and uh, let's do that. And then in terms of the council, you know, if we could let them get through the, do you want to get through, uh, uh, Roger, do you want to, do you want to break this up and do council comments and questions after the, after the overview and then do the, the projects or do you want to do both? presentations at once and then take all the comments. Mr. Mayor, uh, we are we're splitting this in two parts. So the first part would be on the public works uh, operations and then we'll have a break and then we'll f start the next part, which is the grant projects. Okay, but so here's my question. So do we want to do, do you want to do both presentations and then have council?
comment? Both presentations. You can have you can have questions after the first part, and then we do the second one. Oh, I got it. Okay, sounds great. We'll do, do it that. that. We'll do it that way. Okay, and uh, thank you, by the way, for providing the powerpoints to us. I think that's going to be helpful for us to remember when to uh, you know come back and refer to it. All okay. right, good stuff. So then uh, I'm going to uh, give the floor to Lori Ann, and she can um, she can introduce you. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. So tonight we have uh, a lot of great information to share with you. Uh, tonight's study session is part three of a multi-series uh, set of study sessions about different departments in the city and their operations. This is all leading up to the conversation that we will be having starting next month on the fiscal year 23-24 uh, budget, which starts on July 1st. And so we've already talked about parks and community services, their programs and operations. We had an opportunity to talk about the development services department, their operations. And so tonight is a two-part presentation. The first part will be about our public works department, the, the, the multitude of operations that they oversee. Um, you'll be, I think, very um, much interested in the, the information that Raj is going to share. I can say that even with all the experience that I've had in different cities and working with public works departments even, and seeing this presentation even before it came to you, I was again taken aback by the volume of work that this department does and the variety of different uh, programs and operations that they have. And so that first part of the presentation will be about that. We've been doing this series of presentations to you about different departments, all in anticipation of having a conversation this year about our budget leading into next year that is um, informative for you so that you have a context and background as we start deliberating on next year's budget. Over the next three months, uh, we will have additional conversations about other departments, but also the budget proposal that uh, Carol Molina, our finance director, is working on so that when you get the budget, uh, you'll have some of this information already at your fingertips and have reflected on it. And so I'm really hoping that um, this will be uh, fruitful information for you tonight. As Raja mentioned, the second part of the conversation will be about grant-funded parks projects. And the reason we're bringing that this evening is so that we can start getting feedback uh, from you, our council, but also um, to get direction on you know, uh, the input and the feedback that you want to get from our commissions, our committees, so that we can, uh, when all is said and done, put uh, the correct allocations into the budget and so that we have sufficient time to do that. Again, we have about three months before the budget will come to you for adoption, and we can start having those conversations now. We'll also have to put in some applications at the state level. We have received funding allocations, but those allocations are subject to a lot more specificity, and so we're hoping to start that conversation tonight. So tonight is not, uh, you're not voting, as you know. Tonight is a study session. Uh, what we'd like to take away from that second part of the conversation is um, just general overview on uh, anything that you think is an absolute yes, an absolute no, a maybe so, or if, if it's just as simple as referring it to uh, a commission or a committee for additional information. So the information you have tonight on the grants piece, that is pure for discussion purposes only. We put together a couple of options to start the conversation, to wet your whistle. Uh, there is a lot more projects that could be considered, and so it's by no means this is the only thing that staff believes should happen. Uh, but we did want to at least give you something to mull over to start the conversation. And so we'll be looking forward to that piece. And then um, finally, the, um, the, there I did, I am hearing some public comment, and then we also received some questions from council members before this evening on other projects. And so just, um, just to not run afoul of you know, any Brown Act issues, and I'll defer to Barron on this. Um, we did agendize this as a grant project conversation, specifically the, the CADI money, the, in particular really more than MIN money, since that's 10 million that has four different sites, but is very flexible by way of what we want to do there with the exception of a couple of projects that we committed to on LED lighting. And so that's what was agendized for this evening. There's a much larger CIP that you will be seeing and we'll be discussing uh, probably next month. And so I think uh, the discussions about those other types of projects would be in that context 
and it would be agendized that way for the entire capital improvement program, which has many other projects than what we're talking about this evening. But you know, just to make sure that um, we're all clear on uh, how this was agendized for this evening, it is regarding the grant projects, specifically the state funded grant projects tonight. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our very capable and uh, full of energy uh, public Works Director here and his uh, great team, Raja Satharaman. Thank you. Thank you, Lorian. So again, good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council, City Manager, staff, and the community. Thank you for the opportunity that you're giving us to talk about Public Works Department and um, recently awarded grant projects uh, on this rainy day. Today also is, is Pi Day for us engineering nerds out there. <clears throat> So, so uh, as we mentioned, we separated this into two distinct presentations, one on our department, and the next one would be on the grant projects. So for the first part, I'm joined uh, by our city engineer, Sung Yang, uh, Jennifer Rosales, our transportation services manager, and Rob Ryan, who's our maintenance services manager. And I want to thank our staff from our city manager's office, uh, Alma Reyes, uh, Hadassah Jakar, and Sergio Escobar. They made this presentation, engineering presentation, look great. So thank you for them. So this is the mission of our public works department, and we developed this almost 10 years ago. Uh, so, so the public works department is dedicated to delivering vital services through efficient utilization and allocation of resources to provide the Costa Mesa community with opportunities to enjoy an unsurpassed quality of life. So that's our mission. So to do that, we have a total of 75 staff members um, and 6.25 full-time equivalents in part-time staff. And we are organized into four divisions, um, administration, engineering, transportation, and maintenance. Um, within that, we have many functions, um, like energy sustainability is under administration, and engineering has uh, many functions, including construction management, uh, aqua transportation and uh, street sweeping, et cetera. So I'll talk about the administration section and then, and then we'll transition to engineering. In the administration, we have a total of five staff members and we oversee all the divisions covering 22 functions. Um, we develop and manage the department budget uh, and track council goals and priorities that pertain to public works. Energy and sustainability uh, is part of administration division, and um, we have some key achievements in that, uh, in that division over the past year, which includes uh, achieving the lead goal certification for the city, um, charging stations project, as well as starting the first uh, Earth Day Festival. And this position is currently vacant, and recruitment is in progress. Um, but we are working hard to host the next Earth Day event on April 22nd. Another function within uh, administration is the recycling section, which is also the, the waste and recycling section. So here we administer the city's waste hauler program. The city has fran franchise haulers that provide waste hauling services to commercial and multifamily dwellings in the city. Um, single family units are provided by Costa Mesa Sanitary District. Um, in addition, this section administers um, construction demolition, waste disposal, and the new SB 1383 Organics Recycling Program. Um, this is a, a state mandated, both are state mandated programs to divert landfill waste um, from these sources. So that's, uh, that's a new state mandate that we took on as part of this section. With that, um, we're moving to engineering, and Sang Yang, city engineer, will take this over. Thank you, Mr. Seth Raman. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Madam Pro Tem and honorable members of the city council, good evening. My name is Sung Yang, and I'm your city engineer. And it's with great privilege and distinction I, I give you present our engineering division, along with our distinguished public works staff, division managers, and others as well. So let's begin off with the engineering division, which uh, consists of the, the various sections that you see before you, which is water quality, streets and parkway improvements, storm drain improvements, development, real property, park development, and construction management. So succinctly, the engineering division has a, a staffing of 23 full-time equivalents, 
and 1.5 FT as well, which is, represents part-time staff across these seven sections that I've just previously mentioned. It has an operating budget of close to uh, a little over $4.1 million and responsible for the following, the design and construction of the city's capital improvement pro program, uh, design and development of all the parks and open space facilities, and construction management of public works improvements, and also development review and processing as well. So, the first uh, section I'd like to talk about is water quality. The water quality section has one full-time staff member, and this individual is responsible for implementing and monitoring the city's compliance with the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination, Elimination System, which is known as NPDES. Uh, in addition, uh, the water quality section manages the Santa Ana Regional Water Quality Board and, uh, and manages the directives for compliance with the Federal Clean Water Act. In addition, uh, this, this staff pre prepares the annual program effectiveness assessment, PEA, which is done near the end of every year, which uh, analyzes the, our program's effectiveness in terms of water quality. And lastly, uh, we also coordinate the compliance with Newport Bay Total Maximum Daily Load, or otherwise known as TMDL regulations. The next section is the streets and parkway improvement section. Um, it has five full-time staff that oversees and is responsible for design and construction of street capital improvement program uh, projects, and also manages the parkway maintenance program, including curbs, gutters, and sidewalks. It also administers and oversees our PMS program or pavement management program. Uh, we also review and approve our, all engineering submittals. It includes uh, looking over improvement plans, reviewing material reports, going over utility work, um, doing our engineering estimates, and making sure that we adhere to the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA accessibility. And uh, we also secure federal, state, and local competitive grant funding uh, for all of our street and improvement projects as well. So here are some uh, performance metrics back in 2022. Uh, these are some of our, uh, some of our distinguished accomplishments that, we've, uh, that we have uh, encumbered upon. So we have done over 111,000 lineal feet of roadways that, are, that have been re rehabilitated, over 10,000 linear feet of curb and gutter that was reconstructed, over 13,000 driveways that square feet of driveways being built, 50 curb ramps being installed, uh, a little over 69,000 lineal feet of new and improved bicycle facilities being constructed. And we have a PCI index of 83.1, which in layman's terms is very good. So the next section is the storm drain improvement section. Um, this section has about two full-time staff and uh, these individuals are responsible for designing and managing the construction of the city storm drain system which we have approximately uh, 65 miles of storm drain uh, structures uh, within our borders here at the city of Costa Mesa. We also draft, implement, and also execute our storm drain system master plan, which is currently under review and oversight uh, as we speak today. So uh, in terms of development, the development section has full, full time staff and is responsible for reviewing private development submittals, uh, issu issuing encroachment permits for work that's being done in our public right of way uh, we identify development conditions for our planning commission during their hearings and meetings. And also we administer the subdivision map back requirements. And here's some a little bit, a little taste of some of the accomplishments uh, back last year in 2022. We had 900 development reviews that were conducted. We issued over 660 encroachment permits. And we have close to a million dollars collected in encroachment fees that were collected. So the real property section is made up of one full-time individual, and that uh, person manages the easements, vacation, and abandoning the public rights of way, and also agreements uh, associated with that. We also negotiate uh, easements, uh, new ones, or ones that are currently in, in being processed. We prepare real property documents. And lastly, we administer consultant uh, services that's related to the acquisition and relinquishment of real property, which re relates to our project works, public works projects. So park development, uh, as the saying goes, parks makes life better, right? So the park development consists of two full-time staff. It's responsible for development and renovation of all of our park uh, facilities. We administrate the design and construction of new park projects and renovation of existing park facilities, uh, one of which recently was a, a Lions Park playground. And we also help secure uh, park and open space competitive grant funding as well. 
And our uh, last slide is construction management. And this comprises of five full-time uh, staff and we're responsible of uh, getting projects uh, completed and constructed. So we administer construction, executing construction management contracts. We manage and inspect construction activities in our public right of way and make sure our facilities and parks are in tip top shape and that they're uh, constructed according to plan. We also oversee the construction and implementation of our city's capital improvement program, otherwise known as our CIP program. And also we administer the compliance, of the federal state uh, labor laws, uh, which are important, uh, making sure that prevailing wage regulations, disadvantaged business participation, equal opportunity laws, and con public contract laws are all adhered to and overseen. So that concludes the uh, engineering division. I'd, I'd like to re defer to Ms. Jennifer Rosales, who is our transportation services manager, to talk about the transportation services section. Great, uh, thank you, Mr. Yang and Mr. Seth Rahman. It is my pleasure to provide a summary of the transportation services division, uh, which consists of the traffic planning section, traffic operations section, and the active transportation section. Uh, we have seven full-time staff and we have two uh, part-time engineering interns um, in the transportation division. Uh, we have an operating budget of 3.1 million and uh, we are currently managing over 25 multimodal transportation CIP projects, uh, which include active transportation, traffic calming, street and traffic signal design, signing and striping plans, traffic signal synchronization projects, intersection improvements, and uh, safety planning studies. Uh, this division is uh, responsible for the maintenance of the city's traffic operations infrastructure, uh, design of transportation projects, um, again, active transportation, transportation planning, development review, and uh, the new residential permit parking program. Uh, starting with the traffic uh, planning section, uh, we have uh, 3.5 uh, full-time equivalents um, responsible for implementing the circulation element of the general plan as well as the local road safety plan. Uh, this includes multimodal transportation planning and design activities um, and it includes implementing short and long range improvements. Uh, this section also applies for uh, grant funding for transportation projects. Uh, the section reviews and monitors development projects, and I'll give some stats on the next slide. Um, administering the traffic impact fee program, uh, coordinating with other agencies on transportation activities, including OCTA, Caltrans, and SCAG, and then also uh, providing reporting requirements to those agencies as well. Uh, managing uh, the school cro crossing guard contract, and then also managing uh, the bus shelter contract, film permit applications, and oversized load permits. Uh, this section, uh, in the past year, in 2022, um, the section responded to uh, 199 uh, resident requests. Uh, this is equivalent to about one new request per day, about a seven, 17 per month. Uh, these requests can range from everything from a red curb request to speeding complaints to um, a variety of different uh, requests. Uh, many of them include, actually most of them include a field, a field review, uh, some include traffic uh, data collection, collision history review, a full evaluation, uh, findings, and then uh, responding to residents with um, potential actions and um, next steps. In addition, the section um, um, completed four traffic calming pilot projects uh, last year that were implemented and evaluated. Uh, these were on Meyer Place, Royal Palm, Cabrillo, and East 18th Street. Uh, the section uh, conducted or completed 150 planning development reviews, completed 723 building plan checks related to transportation, uh, completed over 300 traffic control plans reviewed, uh, also processed 46 film permits, and processed 168 oversized load permits. Uh, one uh, significant achievement I wanted to highlight of this section is over the past year uh, is the development of the new uh, residential permit uh, parking program. Uh, the the uh, next section, traffic operations, uh, has 2.5 uh, full-time equivalents. Uh, this section is responsible for maintaining, operating, and updating uh, the city's traffic signals, traffic control devices, and streetlights in the city. Uh, the section manages the overall uh, traffic flow 
um, with ITS elements, which is intelligent transportation systems. Uh, this includes traffic signal coordination, uh, CCTV cameras, uh, video detection for all users, uh, which can detect bicycles, uh, the city's emergency vehicle preemption system, and the city's uh, centralized traffic management center. Um, in addition, uh, the section plans, designs, and implements uh, multimodal um, improvements, including radar speed uh, feedback signs, uh, new bicycle timing, and then um, also enhanced pedestrian crossing improvements. Some of the major accomplishments for the traffic operations uh, section is the uh, maintenance and operation of 130 traffic signals, uh, three Hawk signals um, operate in and maintain. That's similar to the Hawk signal is uh, the type of signal that we just recently implemented on uh, Mary Mac Way. And then also operate in maintaining 60 traffic uh, speed uh, related devices, including radar speed feedback signs, and then also um, pedestrian uh, rapid flashing beacons, such as the one shown on the photo on this slide. Uh, also, uh, this section uh, completed the design um, with the consultant for the Baker Placentia Victoria 19th Street traffic signal synchronization projects and has uh, developed signal timing plans for the implementation of 26 uh, new LPIs to be installed um, at 26 intersections. And then um, the active transportation section uh, has um, two uh, full-time equivalents in this section uh, responsible for implementing the active transportation plan component of the circulation element, also addressing bikeway and pedestrian issues and requests, uh, planning and designing and constructing bicycle and pedestrian facility improvements, as well as complete street solutions, and then uh, implementing the citywide bicycle rack program. And I'll give stats on the next slide. Um, some of these activities of active transportation include uh, walk to school events, uh, which last year 13 elementary schools participated in. In addition, uh, bike to school events, which we had nine elementary schools participate in those events. Uh, this section uh, was awarded a grant uh, in the amount of 630,000 to develop a safe routes to school action plan, uh, which will be a new uh, CIP project. Um, also completed the draft uh, pedestrian master plan uh, designed bicycle facilities on Bristol, Wilson, Placentia, and West 19th Street, which will be going to construction soon, and then uh, also installed 15 bicycle racks. With that, I will, uh, Rob Ryan will discuss uh, the maintenance division. Thank you, Ms. Rosales. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council, uh, it's my privilege to be here this evening. Uh, my name is Rob Ryan. I'm the, I'm the privilege to serve as the maintenance services manager. Uh, I'll just take a few minutes to share um, what my amazing team does on a daily basis. Uh, the maintenance service division is comprised of 38 full-time staff and seven part-time staff spread across five sections. The division has an operating budget of over $12 million and is responsible for the maintenance, repair, and alterations or improvements of the city's municipal facilities and infrastructure. Uh, this would include the maintenance of vehicles and equipment, landscape and parks and parkways, maintenance of the city's urban forest, roadway maintenance, traffic signs and markings maintenance, oversight of the street sweeping operations, maintenance of storm drain systems, as well as the graffiti and abate abatement. As I mentioned, the maintenance service division is structured in five sections, uh, park and parkway maintenance, facility maintenance, fleet maintenance, warehouse operations, and street and traffic operations. Uh, the first that I'd like to speak with you uh, tonight about is the park and parkway and media section. It has seven full-time staff, including two ISA certified arborists. Uh, it's responsible for overseeing the maintenance of over 226 acres of landscape, including parks, sports fields, bike trails, parkways and medians, as well as the playgrounds and other park amenities within the parks. The section also maintains and manages the city's urban forest of close to 24,000 trees, ensuring that the city retains its recognition as Tree City USA. Parks and Parkway Maintenance also provides support related to landscape irrigation and playgrounds for all capital improvement projects. We work cl closely with our partners in engineering. Uh, in addition, this section reviews conditional use permits for any event held in a city and reviews building permits as they relate to landscape and irrigation and public rights of ways. Some of the key accomplishments of this section over the past year include the annual renovation of over 30 acres of sports field turf and infield playing surface, 
The completion of the replacement of the playground equipment and rubberized surface at Jordan Park. Uh, completed and replaced the playground equipment and fitness equipment and rubberized surfacing at Tanager Park. Uh, we worked closely with our, our team in parks and community services as well as engineering to complete the design and conversion of the abandoned basketball court in Tanager Park into two new pickleball courts. We responded to over 1,200 tree-related calls and work orders. It can range from anything requests for removals uh, to additional maintenance to just general concerns about trees. Uh, we planted over 300 trees throughout the parkway, through the Parkway Tree Planting Program, Earth Day event, Arbor Day event, and other projects throughout the city. Next up is our facility maintenance section, which has nine full-time and two part-time staff. They're responsible for the maintenance and repair of 23 city-owned buildings with over 314,000 square feet of space. This section also repairs the Snoopy event structures and plays an inter integral role in the setup of that event. This section provides support for all buildings and facility-related capital improvement projects. It also administers smaller building mod modification projects for buildings and facility projects under $30,000. Last year, this section replaced all the fluorescent light fixtures in city hall stairwells with LED lighting with battery backup, assisted with the installation of new HVAC units at multiple city-owned buildings, completed the upgrade of the fire alarm system at city hall, and they respond to 1100, over 1,100 requests for service or repair to city-owned buildings. This on top of the work resulting from their own inspections and preventative maintenance schedules. Now the next section is our fleet maintenance and warehouse operations. They have seven full-time staff and three part-time staff. Now they're responsible for the procurement, maintenance, and repair of the city's inventory of over 300 vehicles and other machines, including fire apparatus, police vehicles, police motorcycles, maintenance trucks, heavy construction equipment, as well as emergency backup generators. The section monitors the city's 14 fuel distribution sites, which provide fuel to city vehicles. Performed last year over 1,200 preventive maintenance services and 500 brake services. Uh, the warehouse team orders, stocks, and maintains an inventory of essential goods, materials for the city. They deliver requisitions of goods to city facilities and departments. They receive and ship orders and they maintain a surplus inventory, uh, transfers and schedule pickup of items relay, uh, that are resellable for auction, uh, electronic e-waste, scrap metal recycles, tire disposals, uh, they process recyclable items, uh, as well as perform end of the month recon reconciliation processes. Uh, the next section is our street maintenance section. That's 12 full-time and two part-time staff, and it's structured in five separate subsections. The first is street cleaning, uh, they oversee the contracted services for the sweeping of 850 miles of residential, commercial, and arterial roadway lanes in the city. The city also operates a sweeper for emergency response and trail maintenance. The city does have an agreement with the county to maintain a small section of bike trail from Victoria Street to PCH. The city also operates a mini sweeper that's used to maintain some of the newly established black bike lanes on Merrimack Way and Bristol Street. The team removes over 1,500 tons of debris annually, preventing it from entering waterways. Over 90% 90, 90 of that material is converted into compost. Next is street maintenance. Uh, they maintain 525 lane miles of streets, 15 miles of city alleys and miscellaneous easements. They respond to and repair potholes, usually within 24 hours of being noticed. The team removes, on average, over 6,000 bulky items and over 500 abandoned mattresses from city parkways annually. They assist with the transportation setup of the annual Snoopy event, uh, at, and since 2018 has worked with uh, our, our team in transportation to install 93 bike racks throughout the city. Next is signs and markings. Uh, signs and markings installs and maintains all traffic and uh, street and traffic signage and pavement markings. The team repainted over 1 million feet of lane striping last year, repainted nine crosswalk locations, and completed over 70,000 linear feet of red curb painting. The team responds to and, and completed 75 work orders to prepare the transportation division annually. Uh, we do produce a majority of our own signs in-house. Uh, you see in the bottom picture there, that's Daniel making a, one of the many uh, speed limit signs that was uh, really re recently produced and installed. Um, 42 speed limit signs, and that was as part of the speed limit reduction project that included 18 segments. Um, they also assist in the invitation of traffic calming projects. Uh, next up is the storm drain maintenance. 
They maintain the city storm drain system in 1,165 catch basins on a regular basis. They're inspected and cleared prior to anticipated rain events. And the team also responds to spills and emergency cleanup on city streets. Finally, graffiti abatement section has three full-time staff that are responsible for removal of graffiti in the public right-of-way, public parks, city-owned facilities, and on private structures where it's visible from the public right-of-way. It's usually done within 24 hours of notification. In addition, the graffiti team pressure washes city playgrounds, high traffic bus stops, sidewalks, and city facilities. This last year, the team responded to over 6,500 calls for graffiti removal, which is a 45% increase over last year. Uh, every day Andrew comes in and he, that's our lead maintenance worker for graffiti and he is excited still, even with that increase in volume. He loves his job and appreciates the opportunity to help keep Costa Mesa beautiful. So I want to share that with you. Um, the maintenance division operates a 24 hour standby response, responds to emergencies that occur outside normal operating hours. In addition uh, to the above areas of responsibility, the maintenance service division provides support to the Parks and Community Services Commission. Um, Division also provides support for special projects and events such as Snoopy House event, uh, LA Chargers training camp, Love Costa Mesa Day, Arbor Day, and Earth Day, just to name a few. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, so the department, um, as, as Rob mentioned, provides support to committees and commissions. Uh, the Transportation Services Div Division supports or is a liaison for the Atwood Transportation Committee and the Traffic Impact Fee Committee. Um, so uh, the transportation uh, committee, Act for Transportation Committee, has uh, 11 voting members, a uh, total of 12 individuals that attend this meeting, um, and it's it's mainly related to all things Act for Transportation. Uh, the Traffic Impact Fee Ad Hoc Committee uh, they meet annually. Um, sometimes it's one meeting a year. Sometimes it could be multiple meetings, depending on if we're doing a major update. Um, it has five voting members that are listed here and two city council liaisons and a planning commission liaison. Um, and the staff provide support to both planning commission and parks and community services commission. Uh, our city engineer attends every single planning commission meeting um, and um, the staff provides support on um, CUPs, uh, providing conditions of approval or other development projects. And uh, on, on environmental projects, we we review the transportation section of the environmental documents. And we also uh, help process the general plan amendments that are related to circulation element. On the Parks and um, Community Services Commission, our maintenance services manager attends each meeting and uh, prepares agenda uh, reports and, and presents them on, uh, on tree removals and memorial plaque requests. Um, and also we provide updates on park maintenance activities. Um, so we work with uh, not just uh, our department, within, within all other city departments, we work closely with everyone, but we also have outside agency partners that we do work with on a daily basis. These include all the utilities that we work with, uh, like Mesa Water, um, Edison, and all that, and then we have uh, regional agencies like Caltrans and SCAG, OCTA, and then uh, also our neighboring cities. We work collaboratively with, with all of these um, in many projects. Um, so that le leads us to many, uh, that has led us to many awards over time uh, for many of our uh, capital improvement projects. Few of them are listed here, or, or pictures of them. So uh, as you heard from all the managers, um, the, the, the variety of work we do is quite extensive, um, very challenging. And you know we have been doing this work for a long time, the same kind of work. But what's different now is the volume of it has gone up a lot. As, as Rob mentioned, the graffiti calls has gone up from 4,000 to 6,500 in one year. Uh, so what, what it does is it, it provides, it, it takes away staff from 
doing what they should be doing, which is other things too, like cleaning the bus stops or high frequency bus stops or uh, park facilities. So it takes away, it takes time away from doing those kind of things to to focus on more graffiti cleaning. So it's just an example. Same thing with with uh, with permits. Um, the number of permits that we process on fourth floor is significantly higher than what we had before. Um, in addition, it's not listed here, but we all, we had. 2,000 visitors who come to our floor asking for different things. Uh, some processing permits, some asking for parking permits or encroachment permits, all these things. So we had, we had 2,000 such visits to our, our floor. So, so all this is um, good work that's done by our staff. And, and so there are definitely challenges that we face. Uh, so like all other departments, we have staffing issues with recruitment and retention. Um, not everything is done by our staff. We do hire consultants to help us out. But again, even, you know, that's a challenge um, in that way too. Uh, the large number of CIP projects, uh, the, the complexity of the projects, they exceed our resources at this time. The facilities that we have, um, most of our buildings were built decades ago. Um, City Hall is 50 years old. Uh, West Side Substation is even older than that. So these, these need constant maintenance um, and upgrade, and we really need a, a master plan for that. We need uh, to understand what needs to be done, where we should focus our efforts, and have an implementation plan. The, the construction and commodity prices, they have been growing, um, rising over the last uh, you know, four or five years. The, the estimates we make today may not be valid even six months from now. Uh, that's how it's fast it's, it's changing. Um, and, and we are seeing that on many of our projects. Uh, the, again, the increased workloads, we talked about that. Uh, you know, we are handling all the routine issues, projects and community needs, and the workloads are increasing in all these uh, aspects. With that, you know, we do have opportunities. Uh, we, appreciate the support that we get from our elected officials, from you, from our leadership, and from the community. They do appreciate the projects that we do and the services we provide. Um, we have policies that we have uh, to maintain our infrastructure at high level, and that, that has helped us too. Um, many years ago, the, the capital asset needs ordinance was passed, the CAN ordinance, that dedicates 5% towards capital projects, and that has definitely helped because we improved 100 of the 130 alleys were improved because of that. And our streets are at 83 uh, PCI. I mean, that's those are the benefits of that. Um, the, the, your goals and priorities that you give us, I, I think that definitely um, gives us a, a roadmap of where we should focus our resources, and, and that's definitely helpful. The, the cooperation, collaboration we get from our departments, all the city departments, we work with finance, development services, we work with fi fire, police, everybody, uh, parks and community services. The, 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 the support that we get from all of them is, is you know, something that uh, we really appreciate. And, and I'm thankful for our motivated, dedicated, and, and staff who are really committed to our mission to provide the community with an unsurpassed quality of life. So with that, uh, our staff is here to answer any questions you might have. So council, we're on discussion mode. It looks like, um, Andrea, you're first. Just a couple of quick ones, um, and not actually even for you, Rob. <laughs> do we know, uh, maybe for you, but I was going to ask police, do we know what the source of the increased graffiti is? I mean, I know that we had an incident last week where sort of two sides of town going back and forth tagging each other. Can we? What, what else can we say about that, and what else can we do about that? Well, I guess all I can add is that we, we have definitely seen an increase in our gang activity. So uh, and that obviously is going to correspond with, with the increase in graffiti. Uh, we're working to address it, but uh, deep down roots and what's causing that or what's causing the increase in the gang activity, I'm not exactly sure. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, I think my only other comment was just about rather than a facilities master plan, I think uh, Mayor Pro Tem Harlan brought this up the other day that we've got a, a whole heck of a lot of master plans. I think what would probably be more helpful at this point is a facilities condition assessment. So just a snapshot in time scale of one to five or one to 10 for, um, you know, FFE and other things like wh where are we at so that that would help both us and you prioritize facilities moving forward rather than um, when we hear about the West Side substation, you know, being in disrepair, we can be a little bit more proactive about it. So um, I, th I think that's, you know, <laughs> one more thing to add to your list, but I think a facilities condition assessment within the next year would be very helpful. Thank you. Excellent. Other, other council members, council, sorry, Manny. I know it's hard because we're used to seeing you know, all formal and stuff. Well, first of all, thanks so much for your presentation. Um, I want to begin with a few comments and then some questions. First of all, I want to commend your department for a couple things. One, keeping our roads in such a great condition. It is a prize. It is a prize and a joy to be the second best city in Orange County for our road quality. And I also commend our, our team for being so quick at removing graffiti. I know I go on daily walks in, in my district and I always make sure I report and graffiti I see and it's always gone within 24 hours. So thank you so much and give your staff that, that thank you as well. Um, a few questions I have, I'll, I'll begin with more of, the, more of just routine, how do things happen? So during, during the presentation, we discussed that medians fall within your department. How do we as a, how do we as a department in the city prioritize what roads get medians? So Cosmo Chavez, uh, the way um, we prioritized the medians um, was based on accident uh, history. So when we, uh, and, and you know, the medians that were done um, most recently, I mean, there are four that were done, um, Harbor, Red Hill, Bristol, and Placentia. Um, and, and we have in the works for Adams down the road. Um, we most of these these were done through actually grant projects. We applied for grants through Highway Safety Improvement Program, and they all qualified based on the number of um, broadside accidents that we had, and they can be corrected by the medians. So that's how they were prioritized. Many years ago, um, this is going back 15, 20 years ago, there were plans for medians on Placentia, south mm. of Wilson Street. Um, but we had a lot of uh, opposition from the community around that area at that time. And I know that plans were scrapped at that time. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy you mentioned Placentia because that's south of Wilson. It's probably an area we want to consider doing something to, cur to curtail the speeding that goes on there. I live on West 20th Street between Pomona and um, Wallace, and you hear that noise every single night. So. Um, curious how we get meet, how we get the medians. Thank you for answering that question. I'll also share alongside that corridor effort. A lot of residents in District One, um, particularly interested in medians on South Coast Drive. I know that the rep for District One isn't here today, but that's something I want to make sure that we're aware of um, because sometimes representatives don't voice those concerns. Um, another question I had was regarding Luke Davis Field. I know it wasn't mentioned in, in today's presentation, but I'm assuming this department maintains that field. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, I would, I'm curious, because it's always closed off to the community. Wh when, when do we see that field being utilized predominantly? Like, when do we see that field being used? So, Councilman Chavez, that is a program field. Mm -hmm. So, it's, it's rented for both soccer and softball and baseball. Okay. And, and who, who is, you, who is uh, renting the space for, for soccer and baseball? I don't know exactly who's renting the space. That's recreation oversees the, uh, the programming of the spaces like Jack Hammett, Team of Athletic Complex, Luke C. Davis Field is treated in the same manner as, uh, as those, those areas as well. Okay, got it. So, so, that's, so that's more for the Parks Department. Yeah, they are they're two organized. I know there's at least two organized groups there. Okay. Um, one thing I want to mention, and I know staff knows about it, is I want to see us bring back that agreement at some point. Um, I think it's a, sh a darn shame that the biggest green field in Wasa Costa Mesa is closed. 
um, and it's closed because it's being used by organizations that aren't really been, I don't know if they're benefiting our community or not, but I just think it's a shame that we're maintaining that field, but our kids can't use it. Um, next on the line of like parks and community service department, I know it, was, it was cool seeing the interface this department has with the Parks and Community Services Commission. Um, in an average meeting, what what are you guys presenting to the department, to the Parks Department? So um, I'll, I'll start that and maybe Rob can add to that. But uh, typically there are three more requests that we get from the residents that, that uh, we prepare a report for, we evalu evaluate and, um, and then prepare a report and we present that. Um, and then there could be projects that may require tree removals. So we, we might have a project that will require, so we take those two to the Parks Commission. And then sometimes it's landscape um, plans that we develop for a project, um, for median project. We take those two uh, to Parks Commission. Um, other things could be, um, you, you provides periodic updates. Um, our maintenance manager provides periodic uh, updates almost uh, every other meeting on activities, um, uh, maintenance activities in parks. Okay, so it seems like it's really re in relation to, um, I'm just gonna say like, 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 like green things, like trees, medians, we have vegetation, things of that nature. Um, do, do you guys provide them updates on CAP projects or is that something that's not within the, 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 the scope of your department? So we, annually, we take um, the CIP um, uh, the, the the CIP projects that are up for in the budget. We take it for both Planning Commission and Parks Commission approval. So so the, the, as it relates to Parks projects, for example, we take those to to Parks Commission. So so that that goes annually to to the commission. Okay. So so basically, when when our project is, is, is about to be worked on, that's when it gets brought to the parks department. Is that, is that fair to say? Uh, yes, when we, so when we, so when right now we are pre preparing our CIP budget for next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So we'll come to you at a study session in April with that, but then it also goes to planning and parks commission um, in April or May timeframe. So okay. they get to see and, and provide comments on the CIP before it gets into the budget process, into, into, the, into the adoption of the budget. And then when there are parks projects, for example, when we did Tanager Park um, uh, or Jordan Park, we take the plans to Parks Commission so they can review and approve. They provide us the approval of the plans for implementation. So those projects go to them. Okay, got it. So it seems like CIP... It's, it's, it's just brought, it's brought to them when it's necessary. But when it relates to parks like Tanger and Fairview, that's when they're more actively engaged. Um, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm asking these questions very publicly because I've noticed that the trend in the parks bar meetings where there's a lot of questions regarding CIP projects and I sense frustration with that, with that body. And I just wanna make sure that everyone's aware of the exact role they play. So it seems like, just to reiterate, when it comes to CIP projects, they're gonna be brought, they're gonna be given information when it's time to be given to them. And when, unless it relates to like anything green like trees or medians or or like more more environmental parks like Tanger, Fairview, that's when they're hands on. Thank you for that clarification. I really appreciate it. Um, and then finally, just two quick comments I wanna make. Um, I definitely do think we need to have some kind of master plan update or master plan implementation for aging facilities. Um, our cities around, you know, we're, we're, in, we're, we're about three quarters of the way to being one, one year, 100 years old. And that means a lot of buildings are getting that age where they kind of need some rehab. So I think having a concrete idea of what we need to be prioritizing, particularly when it comes to public safety for our, for our, our PD and our fire department is crucial. I know, I think our role as council is really simple. It's really three things, is everyone safe? Do we have our public safety staffed up? It's quality of life and it's revenues. And I think that's a really important thing for us to do is know what's in the docket that needs to be, be improved. So thank you for mentioning that as part of the challenges and opportunities. And also I'll end with this, um, and I think it'll be a good conversation for next, for next month, but I do think it's time for us to really look at the CIP as a council and really start prioritizing the actual priorities on there. Um, costs are going up for projects 
Um, a lot of us have a lot of things we want to get done. We all saw that um, on Friday at, at the retreat. And I think same thing for priorities of staff resources. We don't need to, we need to prioritize what we truly want to see accomplished for CIP projects. So um, other than that, I really want to just, just say thank you to your department, Raja. It's really a joy working with them. They're always proactive. They're always the hands on the, 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 hands on the ground, making sure they look safe and is safe. So thank you for your time. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, just want to clarify, sorry, I just want to clarify one answer regarding Luke St. Davis Field. Maintenance Services maintains the outfield grass where the soccer is played. We do not maintain the infield or the infield grass. Who does? That's, uh, that's through an agreement with the user group. Got it, okay. So they maintain it? Correct. Thank, 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 thanks for that clarification, it's extremely important. Okay. That's interesting. Can I just, just uh, while we're talking about Luke Davis Field, so yesterday I was at the Costa Mesa United uh, golf tournament and I was talking to uh, Mark Hatfield, who's uh, in charge of one of the guys, and Jack Morales too, for the Pony Baseball. And they were saying that they'd like to have some improvements, particularly on the infield, and even consider skinning that infield. Jason was there and he talked to them about it. He says that there's, you know how like, when you drag an infield, you develop a, a, an out, outfield ridge between the infield and the outfield? They say that that's really bad there. They, they would bring, bring in a lot of dirt and fix it up. And they're willing to do it and uh, do the work and, and Costa Mesa United and others would participate in the cost. Anyway, apparently it needs that part especially needs a lot of maintenance and, and revision to get it to the level that they'd like it to be. Okay. I yes. Guess. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Lauren. Thanks. So first of all, I just want to compliment everybody who gave a presentation this evening. It was very extensive and it really gives a great scope and idea of what everyone is doing and the procurement of work I know is overwhelming. So. I just want to say thank you for everything that you're doing. A um, couple of things I'd like to ask about. Um, I want to uh, just kind of keep going along with the Luke Davis Field. What's going on with Luke Davis Field? I know that we have a, um, an operating agreement, a usage agreement with uh, Newport Harbor Baseball. I'd like to uh, have a discussion about that. I know now is not the time, but I do want to have that discussion I want to address the field usage. Right now it's a closed off gate and um, you know I heard a story that it really sank in. It sank in later. The story was from Council Member Chavez saying he can remember being a little boy walking with his mom down the sidewalk at a fenced off field wondering why he wasn't allowed to use that field. And I can see maybe that's not the case but from a little boy standpoint walking down the street the city that you live in you're prevented from using. And it's been that way for, for years, for over a decade. That needs to change. We, we need to really seriously quit talking about addressing it, and we just need to address it. You know, Pink Floyd made a song a long time ago, and tear down the wall. Let's open the gate. Let's tear down the gate. There's no reason for us to not let the community use that, that facility. We've talked about it many times. We haven't, all we got to do is turn a key. If someone needs to be there to watch, we can have operating hours, whatever it is. If we got to keep people out of the infield, that should easily be able to be managed. So as far as I'm concerned, Luke Davis Field should be open tomorrow morning for everyone to use, for whatever they want to use it for, run, play, kick balls, lay on the grass, whatever you would be able to do at any other park in any other part of our city, that should be the same way and it's not. So I really want to make sure we look at changing that. The other thing is uh, I know that we have a lot of sports that are taking place and I do want to thank you for the allocation of funds to T. Winkle. I think it's going to be a really great improvement to the facility there. I know there's some needs there and I know that uh, Council Member Marr has also been involved with that. So I want to thank her for being involved because I think we're going to see some great change there. But in addition to that, we need to look at what we can do to sustain the usage there long term. I know there's some short term fixes that we're looking at for right now, but five years from now, eight years from now, when there's 
a new council up here, what are we gonna have done for that field? So I just wanna make sure that we're addressing that. And then something else that uh, you had mentioned, you had talked about fourth floor permits, if I was to quote. And I was wondering if you can elaborate what it is that you meant, you, you said you had two, 2,000 applications, was it last year or so far? And I'm not quite sure what's involved with that what that means and, and maybe if you could just speak to that briefly, that'd be greatly appreciated. Sure. So, um, Conservative Governors, thank you for um, you know, your comments and, and, and the questions. Now, the, what we get on fourth floor is, so, so the permits, so residents come for, and, and business people come for permits, generally to second floor, but they also have business with the fourth floor. Um, when there is work that involves um, any anything on public right of way, we they need to get our approval. So if you're building a house and you're modifying your driveway, so that we get to review that and we have to review and approve the work that's done. Um, when utilities come and work on our right of way, they need to get permits for traffic control plans. They need to make sure that uh, that they're following all our uh, procedures. Um, in in whatever work they do, um, so it's 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 a combination of those two things. So it's either utility companies, uh, private developers, um, homeowners who are working on public right of way. So would any or all CUPs come your way? Yes, they they do come our way too for our comments. So so planning routes it up to us to provide our comments to all the development approvals. Is there any bottlenecking that goes on there in the fourth floor? Does it get held up for, are you overwhelmed with CUP applications? I just need to ask that question. Just as, um, uh, you know, uh, again, it's uh, not intentional, but we have uh, the, the volume of work sometimes uh, exceed, uh, you know, if, if, if too much comes in in a very short amount of time, it does create that kind of bottleneck and issues. Um, we try to streamline it. We try to put more resources where we can. But again, you know, we are limited by the staff we have. I appreciate what you're doing. I would also like to look at talking about what we can do to address that because I, I have heard that there is a bottleneck there, especially regarding CUPs. So if we can address that, that would be, that would be wonderful. So that's all I have right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Council Member. Or sorry, Lauren. Uh, Arliss, I was sorry, were you first? Arliss, go, go right ahead. Okay, um, thank you, I appreciate the discussion so far and everyone's questions and comments. Um, I feel a little tension in my own head right now. It's sort of a blessing and a curse to see under the hood and all of the work that, that happens with these, um, uh, the projects and all of the day-to-day -day operations. I'm. Um, really proud of this department, all, all of course, but today the, the focus is on you um, and all of the work that you've done and, and, and the outcomes that we see in the community. So thank you for that. And I kind of wish I didn't see how much work goes into, <laughs> into making it happen because it's, um, it's so great. So, um, uh, and I also just wanted to say, I'm, I, I sort of acknowledge the change in the department name to Public Works. I know that was, um, I think that was an exciting change. And um, I love the new logo. I've seen the, you know, our, our vehicles going around the city with the new logo. And I always think it looks really, um, really sharp and um, a nice uh, brand, right, for our city. Um, and then uh, congrats on the um, trees planted, the new tree planting program form, the new bike rack um, program form, just lots of really good things happening. So, so thank you for that. Um, trying to figure out where to start here. So maybe with a couple things I learned um, in the staff report, uh, I think the staff report said 23 buildings, but I've learned it's actually more than 23 buildings. The number of buildings we maintain is 23 plus um, all of the bathrooms at our parks, and I think there were a few others that, that weren't on that list. So um, that's a lot. <laughs> um, and 330 vehicles, is that right? It's 300 pieces of equipment. I believe it's about 230 vehicles. Okay. 
That but 300 be. includes all the all the pieces of equipment. The construction equipment and all the other oh, things. Oh, got it. Right. Okay, those count. Okay, okay, that's a lot. That's a lot more than I would have guessed. You should have had us guess these numbers, and we would have <laughs> known how far we off we were. Um, that's pretty incredible, and I um, I appreciate the ask for um, a facilities master plan, and um, I expect that that would start with the condition assessment that was recommended. I, I um, when I hear facilities master plan sort of in this context, I'm thinking of it more as a facilities sort of maintenance master plan, right? It's like how much do we need to be saving every year, and and you know, is it every five years or ten years or whatever years that different things need to be updated, just so that's a part of the regular cycle of funding and not. Um, you know, asks you're putting to the city council every year um, because they may choose to defer it, right? And then we end up with bigger costs. So um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense um, operationally. So definitely support that. And, and I assume that that means buildings and vehicles and parks facilities. Um, sounds like that needs to that needs to get done. Um, and uh, Raja mentioned policies um that sounds like a smart way to do business <laughs> so thank you for mentioning that i think a lot of it seems like we do a combination of work that's sort of driven by our policies and then a combination and then some that's sort of like ad hoc requests or emergency response requests so um i know the the pavement condition index policy or the pavement management program has been one that's really successful in maintaining um good roads um I, do we have something similar for sidewalks? I know we have just sort of a, you know, a, a bucket of funds that we include in our budget every year, but my understanding is that a lot of our sidewalk um, work is, is based on ad hoc requests. Do we have, have any kind of overall assessment of sidewalk needs or a you know, systematic plan to, to meet, to install sidewalks everywhere they should be? Yes, um, Councilman Reynolds, thank you for, uh, you know, even I was surprised by the amount of work that we do. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it, 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 it was a shock for me too that uh, we had so much going on. Um, and, and I agree with, uh, with uh, Councilman Mar about it should be facility conditions assessment. I think that, that makes more sense. I think the master plan is, is good, but I think it, the more immediate need is to do, do, do that conditional assessment um, that will kind of lead to some other goals that what I was thinking of and, and uh, help us in, in achieving that. With respect to sidewalks, yeah, we do have an annual allocation of funds for um, maintaining sidewalks and for um, uh, for uh, repairing uh, anything that needs uh, immediate attention and also adding some new sidewalks. Uh, and as part of our street projects, we do visit every sidewalk on that particular street and, and make sure that, that the sidewalks are good. Um, one thing that I want to point out is we kept the budget pretty much consistent, mm -hmm. as far as I know, for the last many years on how much we allocate for the sidewalk repair. The, but the cost of those services, we contract part of it out, yeah. has, has actually almost uh, went up by 40, 50% because it, even the contractors have to pay, pay prevailing wages. So we. So we're not doing as much of sidewalk grinding as we want to see um, as, as as before. But again, we we try to do the best we can with the resources we have. Yeah, I'm I'm interested in in maybe learning a little bit more about our our process there, and um, want to be considering you know as we're continuing to move to you know multimodal. Um, transportation around the city and, and you know we've got a, a aging population that's going to be walking more um, I think just naturally there's going to be people walking more just making sure that we're looking at, at considering sidewalks similar to how we consider um, uh, sort of vehicle lanes um, another policy that I know we've done a lot of work on alleys in the last few years um, and I think we have a, a, a maybe an older policy around this one I was interested in is um, and this is related to some of our sustainability initiatives is um, updating to a, um, a green alley program. And I think there's some cost saving opportunities there as well. Um, you know, less, less concrete, um, a little bit more green as we, um, as we install um, alley projects over time. Um, and then the last, I, I don't think we have a policy around this, but I just want to acknowledge it because I think it's a change we've made in the last few years. Um, we, and we've talked about this a lot at, at, in, in this room. Um, uh, 
taking advantage of sort of our regular schedule of street rehabilitation projects to incorporate um, other street improvements. And we're going to, we've seen a lot of that already. I know we're going to see a lot of that in the, um, in the coming months. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I don't know if that's a, a policy now or um, maybe we should consider making it. Um, but I would acknowledge that, that, um, that change in the department. I think that's been really smart. Okay, I had a few um, other questions that are a little bit random. So um, for Jennifer, this is just a comment, actually, a quest uh, not a question. So um, maybe related to my last comment, sort of as, um, as we talk about sort of integrating different modes of transportation more, um, you know, where, words matter, and I'm looking at the, you know, how we name the different divisions in our department, and it's, you know, like transportation, or traffic management and traffic planning, and then there's like active transportation over here. I think a lot of the um, state grants, um, and, and just sort of trends in general, we're doing a really good job of incorporating those things, but, um, I, and I'm not asking for any name changes, I just wanna acknowledge that I, you know, I, I want us to keep um, when we're working on transportation and thinking about movement around the city that we're um, sort of integrating all of those um, concepts. But if you want to change the names, that'd be great too. Hold on, I'm just not asking for it. Okay. Um, and then I, um, I, again, just sort of going back to the volume of activity across all of these departments, um, sort of within the department, and then um, was it planning, from planning to public works and back to planning, um, are, are the, Software tools that we've invested in, is that gonna help with some of the project management, like sort of workflow management and all of this? Yes, definitely the land management system that's um, coming online. Uh, we are also working with, uh, with the planning development services department, so um, definitely it'll help a lot um, as we move forward. Okay, okay, good. And that's the one that's coming in this summer? Yes. Okay, great, that's good to hear. Um, okay, so so I have one more question. This is going to be for the director, um, and I I, I want to say I really appreciate probably the slide I appreciated the most in this presentation is the slide on challenges, um, being very direct with us about what you're seeing in terms of of trends, workload, costs, so on. Um, <laughs> what 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 are you asking of us, and what do you need from us for this year? Councilor Reynolds, I think the next meeting, hopefully, I think we'll be coming up with some um, uh, asks on uh, on staffing side. Um, I think we, we want to put this out to just also uh, for you to be aware of uh, the different things that are happening. Um, and, and one of the other thing is the facilities assessment. I think that's something that we need to work on. When, if, you see, if you saw earlier presentation on um, engineering you don't even see a facilities section in that one, right? I mean, you know, because historically we haven't invested much on facilities. Uh, so what we do now is, you know, you, you have park section, you have this, we move people around and, and they've been, you know, so instead of do working on parks, we work on facilities. And that's what we did with uh, Lions Park projects or with, uh, um, with uh, Fire Station 1 or even the current project uh, at uh, PD range remodel. I mean, so a lot of facilities are being worked on, but we try to move staff around and flexibly, that's how we are flexibly staffed in, in, in working on different things. Um, but we need to have some dedicated staff that, uh, that work on facilities so that we can focus on other activities that we are supposed to be working on too. Is that is that an ask for more staff to be focused on to balance those things? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. there, yeah. There there is definitely a need for for staffing help. Um, it's it's definitely a challenge finding good people, but we want to be in the position where we can make that happen. So, um, yeah, having. Uh, Having um, energy sustainability manager will help a lot in in a lot of these projects, as as well as um, your goals on on cap, getting that done. That's uh, that's another one, um, and also um, the the recycling program. I mean, we never had a full time staff member on that one. Um, while we are trying to manage with uh, other resources within, but down the road there could be uh, an issue on that one too. But but we are right now managing with current resources. 
facilities nest or facilities condition assessment and more staff. Okay, that was your chance. <laughs> um, oh, I was gonna mention one thing. Well, okay, so I, I, I do want to touch on the, the conversation related to Luke Davis Fields. Um, agree completely with my colleagues. Um, during our session on Friday, I um, mentioned wanting to include um, health, it, you know, as, as part of our sort of overall um, objectives, acknowledging, not that I want to extend our services in any way, but, but I want to acknowledge how the work that we do today affects the health of our community. Um, and when we look at sort of research on what drives um, community health and individual health in a, in a, um, in a community, in a neighborhood, in a city, um, very strong correlation to access to parks, um, very strong correlation to access to safe public spaces and community spaces. And that's, you know, that's what we build and that's what we manage. So um, park access, so critical. Um, really, really important for so many reasons. Um, we've had some discussion on, you know, different strategies to use parks for revenue generation, and and I just want to say that I always will elevate access over revenue generation at our parks. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, John. Um, I just want to thank the department first. Um, I know you all have a tremendous workload. Um, I can say from personal experience, you're all very accessible and responsive, which I greatly appreciate. And I think I see that in the community as well. Um, your work is among the most visible in the city. Um, and um, I know we experienced that, especially on the east side, whether it's been alley improvements or um, signalized crosswalks uh, or even uh, the most recent uh, Tanager Park, I'm sorry, Jordan Park, but also Tanager Park, um, being uh, basically given new life. And I, I think that's been really um, taken advantage of by our community, and I, and I think that they enjoy that. Um, since you have given us an expansive view of the department operations, I did want to dig a little deeper onto one area, and I don't mean to pick on you, Jennifer, but I'm going to ask the questions. So on the, on the slide that talked about uh, traffic planning accomplishments, this was number 18, I was hoping you might be able to give us a little more insight into, for example, how long it takes to process a film permit application. So that's 46, it looks like one per week, but really, you know, what, what, what's entailed in that? Um, and I'd ask the same of, you know, maybe the over, oversized load permit processing too. Okay, Councilmember Harlan, great question. So a film permit application is one that uh, is basically a request, some, somebody's requesting to like film a video somewhere in the city or, or f any sort of film. And so what's involved is a trans transportation staff member will get the request and then, um, which also includes payment, so it's a process of payment, and then um, send out the request to different departments for their review. Uh, for example, if um, the film's at a park, it goes to the parks department, and there's also other um, coordination with the park staff. If it's at uh, somebody's private home, um, it also goes to like the police department and fire for different reasons. So uh, the coordination with the different departments to make sure that they um, get incorporate their conditions uh, before the permit is issued. So does that permit always start with transportation and then you coordinate among everybody else? That's correct. Okay, so you start and then close the loop and issue the permit. Exactly. Okay, and then what about the oversized load permits? I, I suspect that's more just within your department. Yeah, the oversized load permits are much quicker. Uh, it's just with transportation. Um, basically, we get the permit request in. We make sure that the route that's being requested is a route where we would allow trucks, like a truck route that we have. Um, also, if there's um, height restrictions, make sure it's not a route with height, re height restrictions as well. And as long as the proposed route meets the criteria, um, we process the payment and then issue the permit. Okay. All right, that's all I have right now. <clears throat> Thank you. So a lot of great questions that were um, asked that were on my list, but I still have a lot to say. So. Um, First of all, I just want to commend the department, and in particular you, Raja, on your responsiveness. 
just in general, um, you always have been very responsive ever since I've been on council, but when we had this really difficult weather s circumstance, uh, your department has been really on it. I remember one thing in particular when there was that street sign that was hanging above the Fairview and, and right on the on-ramp. And I don't know, I'm sure that maybe some other council members mentioned it, but it seemed like it took 10. <laughs> but it, it seemed like it took your department 10 minutes to fix it. And, and I can't tell you how impressive that is to the community because we were getting barraged by people that were commenting on something that was obviously uh, potentially dangerous and to be able to fix that so quickly is just elevates the, uh, the, you know, the image of the city as being good, you know, good government, being able to solve a problem and solve it quickly without a lot of red tape. Okay, so thank you for that. The paint uh, on City Hall, it, it looks really good. I think we picked good colors and, yes. and accents, and I think it looks really good. So thank you for that. Um, I, there's one other thing in terms of an assessment that I've always thought it would be worthwhile to do, is um, we get, as you know, as our second item on every single one of our agendas, we get the the re, we call it a reading folder, and it's got the claims that are made against the city by various people. And it seems to me like the claims that we get most frequently, there are claims pertaining to, you know, limbs falling on somebody or people, uh, <coughs> you know, slipping on a crack or crack sidewalks or something like that. And then to a lesser extent, it's the 300 city vehicles out there crashing into people. Um, but but um, but it, I don't remember us ever really doing an assessment on how many claims we have. What are the what's the nature of the claims? How much are we paying out in in cost of the claims? And also, is there are there any trends? And what can we do about that? Because my hypothesis is that if we did that type of an assessment, we would find that it would be a good investment to. Um, put even more resources into the, into the department. And I, I have no doubt that you guys are doing the best you can with the resources that we're being provided. And it's a massive undertaking to take care of, you know, it, there, it's 24,000 24, you know, trees. So I'm not being critical. I'm just saying it's, it, when you look at opportunities, on the last slide, I think an opportunity for us to make the city safer and also to address that fiscal risk uh, would be to do that assessment and then decide if it makes sense financially to drive more resources into that area. Um, I don't know if we can do that in, in connection with this budget cycle, but maybe we do it and then when it comes up, we address it in a, in, in a mid-year, maybe next year or something like that. But as soon as it's ready, I think that would be something to consider. Um, and then I really uh, I want to pick up on something that Arliss said, and she said it at the, at the, um, uh, she said it at the strategic planning thing, and Arliss and I have been talking about this ever since 2017. Is the idea of free play, you know? I'll give you a little personal history. When I was a little boy, we there was no AYSO, there was no NJB, there was no T-ball. Um, we didn't, uh, for the most part, there was Little League. And we all played Little League. 100% of the boys played little, little League. And some of the girls, by the way, played Little League. To my knowledge, there was no softball, sadly. Women's sports were, you know, it was terrible back then. This is in the 70s. But we, for every game, every organized sport game that we played in a league, we played 100 in our front yards and in our and in our, and our schoolyards and in our parks with not an adult insight. And the sad part is, as I, I told you, I, I coached all those years. And I remember one time I said to the kids at one of the late, late practices when I was coaching softball, I go, do kids ever just play softball without a coach bringing out the bag? And they're like, no, coach, we don't. I said, well, today, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to throw the bag in the middle of the field. 
and I'm going to sit here in the dugout and watch you play. And they didn't know what to do. They go, really? <laughs> so I think this thing that Lauren is responding to, what Manny is responding to, is very important. And what Arliss brought up at the retreat is to give kids an opportunity to just play and then encourage them to do it. Because in so many ways, you know, with these organized sports, as much of a commitment as I've made personally to it, there's all kinds of anxiety and parents screw it up. And, you know, it, you, we've all been there. Okay, so if we can do something to bring that back, you know, but bring it back for the girls too, by the way, unlike the 70s, but uh, bring it back for everybody. I think we'd be a, be we'd be a healthier community. I do, do think we would be. All right, those are my uh, large comments and I have about two or three more. Three more maybe? Um, okay, this might seem a little off the wall, but go to page, go to page 22, please. And this is going to be another old school uh, comment. So you see the bike racks there in front of ACMA? Okay. Now these are, I like them. They look good and everything like that. And I'm not being critical or anything. But, I mean, it is in front of ACMA. But it seems to me like the bike racks that, we're, it, that we are installing are these very kind of artistic and aesthetically pleasing bike racks. But what I don't see us installing anymore is kind of the old school bike racks where you stick your front tire in or your back tire in and, and, it, and it like looks like a bike rack. It doesn't look like a piece of art. Is that just passe or are we still doing the old school bike racks as well? We're doing those kind of bike racks too. Um, some of these we do it just to kind of have a, a cool appearance sometimes and and we're also offering you know for example bike racks that look like a coffee cup for a coffee shop or i mean so so there are other kinds of bike racks too that we are trying to do but but other um, like a, if you go to a typical city park or whatever you see the the standard bike racks so we do both kinds okay all right i mean they look great to me my only concern is people don't know their bike racks <laughs> You know, they think they're an art piece. Um, okay, then, uh, you don't need to go to a slide, but I want to know from, I guess it's Rob, would fall in Rob's department, um, to what extent do we work at the golf course uh, and help them with their trees and have our arborists go in there and do some training? Because, um, you know, recently... I put up a video on Facebook and Instagram of one of my favorite trees on the 15th hole. It's a tree that had been there for 50 years, at least 50 years, according to one arborist I talked to. And it fell over because the root ball was so shallow because they over, they over water to, to keep the fairways green. And they over water the, the area and then it creates shallow roots. And then when the ground is moist and we get some wind, these beautiful trees just topple over. And again, my thinking is maybe they don't have the expertise and over, we don't have the oversight of the maintenance folks at the golf course, so we're losing some very mature trees there. Yes, Mr. Mayor, by and large, golf course maintenance, we, we have no interaction with golf course maintenance. Um, by and large, golf course maintenance is focused on the greens, the tee boxes, the fairways, um, and not so much on the trees from my past experience and, and working in private sector maintenance. Um, trees are usually somewhere last on the list as an obstacle, or that's generally speaking. Um, but um, to, your, to your question, we, we don't have any interaction as far as maintenance uh, with the golf course maintenance team. I think that's something we should consider looking into because, I mean, that is city land and uh, it's just tragic when a 50-year-old tree topples over, even though it makes the hole easier, so I'm not going to get my balls into the tree. But, I mean, if I'm being serious, that's a, it's a beautiful tree and it's just not, they're just not being maintained. I think just because they don't know and they're, they just, maybe if we could help and give them some training, I'm sure they'd be open to that. Um, and then, 
The only other thing I have here is on, on uh, uh, page 31, we talk about our storm drain maintenance system. And in, in, in part, we talk about catch basins. Ele I didn't know that we have 1,165 catch basins in the great city of Costa Mesa. So I did learn that today. But we're here, we hear so frequently with all the rain that we're getting is that we're not capturing the rain, okay? And, and then, and so what efforts are we doing in working with Mesa Water or working with ourselves to capture the rainwater so it can go back and be used as part of our, uh, you know, water table? So, if, um, if, yeah, Mr. Stevens, uh, that part of the pro uh, usually that's done at a, at a, at a different level. Um, the, the county water district is doing things like that where they're capturing water and then they transport it to uh, recharge basins in Anaheim to inject into the groundwater so that it becomes part of the, the system. Um, for us, what we try to do with stormwater maintenance is, is, is mainly to to make sure that our system can handle the water that's coming through. Um, so, so what we are trying to do now is build infiltration basins in different areas. Um, we have one by um, by the downtown rec center, um, and we have few others that that we we have one by Arlington Bioswale. So we're doing things like that to capture rainwater, storm water, and and let it percolate into the system. So, so we're, we're doing few things. Um, the 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 ponds at Fairview Park are, you know, one of those features is to capture water from Greenville Bank Channel before it goes to the ocean and then and then run it through that the, the, those ponds. So, so we have few projects like that, but but mainly the the focus is also to make sure that we don't flood our streets. Right. So, so we're trying to manage it by cleaning the system, cleaning the basins and also storing some of the water and letting it out over time. So it's fair to say that the primary focus of the stormwater system is to prevent flooding as opposed to capturing the rain for use. That's correct. However, the, there is new um, requirement. So for, for example, any new project, what they say is you cannot add to the problem. So you cannot have more runoff from a new project. So we require that they install rainwater capture system within their sites. Um, and so, so, so there are efforts being done uh, in multiple fronts, some by private developers and some by the city also. So, so we're trying to not let as much water run through the system and capture some uh, as much as we can into these uh, basins that go into the groundwater. And I remember I was told that at our new training facility for the fire department, we're going to be able to capture almost all of the water that they use for their training. Is that's that right? that's correct. That's one of the requirement of the grant is to capture the water that they use for training and reuse it. Good. Okay. I have no questions. Do any other council members have any questions before we take our break? All right. I just want to say thank you for this part. Just what will this is an intermission, so we'll clap as if we would if it was an intermission. So, uh, thank you. Very thank much. you. All right, uh, we'll take about a ten minute. Let's ten, is ten enough? Yeah. Ten. Ten minute break. Come back at uh, fifty five, six fifty five.
Okay, we're back and we're ready to uh, resume with our the second uh, presentation uh, by staff entitled Public Works Grants Grant Projects. So, do we? Who's going to introduce whom? Raja, you have the floor. Mr. Mayor, um, I have a brief presentation. Uh, this one I have um, uh, asked Mr. Um, Jason Minter, our Parks and Community Services Director, to join, so he'll be available to answer any questions as well. So the city secured um, $14.4 million in grants from um, for various park improvements from our state senator, um, Min, um, Assemblywoman Cody Peter Norris, and Supervisor Foley. So staff is seeking direction from, from you on these projects uh, so that we can start working on our budget and also plan for uh, our applications to the state. So we have $10 million from State Senator uh, Dave Min, and these, uh, the, 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 this is restricted by locations and, um, and, 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 the, and based on some project needs, but we don't have the full uh, restriction on exactly what improvements can be implemented. We have some ideas on, there some guidance on it, but not, not full guidance. Um, the projects are uh, that are required to be done are the LED athletic field lighting for Jack Hammett and Tewinkle uh, Athletic Complex. Uh, at Fairview Park, it's uh, for bluff stabilization and restoration and mesa restoration, and for improvements at Shalimar Park. Just uh, these improvements together may not add up to 10 million. That's why we think there may be chance to add more improvements to this list. Um, for the other two uh, grants, uh, one through Assembly Member Cardi Petri Norris and from Supervisor Katrina Foley, um, we have $1.2 million specific for Ketchum Light Bolt expansion. And we know the project um, in, in, in some level of what, what's needed there. And the other uh, monies are for Lions Park Cafe, uh, about $1.2 million, and Costa Mesa Skate Park expansion for about $2 million. For the Lions Park Cafe, um, again, we have $1.2 million in grant funds. Um, as I mentioned in my previous presentation, the costs of construction is going up, uh, has gone up over time. And, and we think this project could cost um, almost $1.8 million uh, based on our current estimates. Um, there is a scope for this, which is, uh, you know, we have, we have plans from the previous designer that we need to, again, modify based on current building codes. So there is some work that needs to be done, um, and, and we, need, we need to get new approvals from buildings, uh, building division on the, on the building plans. Um, so this is a cafe adjacent to uh, the, the library and, and in between the library and the rec center. And this will provide outdoor dining to complement the event lawn and the campus as a whole. And this will revitalize the area and improve the service to our community. The skate park, it's, um, it's a, we have some preliminary idea of what's needed, and this is expanding the skate park at its current location, um, almost doubling the size of the skate park. Um, this will provide a more a dedicated area for young business, beginner skaters and provide new elements. And, and we need to work on the design in collaboration with our skating community and the neighbors. For Ketchum Leibold, you see 1.5 million. 1.2 is actually the grant through Assemblywoman Cody Petri Norris. We have 300,000 in state grants that we have for this uh, same project from before. So, so combined, we have 1.5 million dollars, and this is to uh, to make changes to the park. To one is expand. Uh, if you see the bottom picture, we have a lot of uh, area that's between the park and uh, Victoria Street sidewalk. We could use that, uh, incorporate that part of the park, and and again add more play elements. Again, we'll work with the community in identifying exactly how um, the design shapes up. I'll, I'll revisit this uh, exhibit um, in, a, in a in a bit. I'll go to the next slide. Um, so for uh, State Senator Min, uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, ten million dollars. 
the required project is uh, LED field lighting, which is for Jack Hammett and Tibinkle Athletics uh, Complex. And we got some quotes from the vendor, and it's about $1.75 million for, for these two projects. And this will provide LED lighting upgrades uh, that will improve the energy efficiency and also um, the reliability of the system as a whole. We have about um, improvements to Shalimar Park, which we estimate to be a million dollars. Again, this is an estimated cost. Um, we we need to work with the community on a, on, a, on on the full scope of the project. Uh, what's needed? What are the elements that they prefer? So so this is something that will be done in collaboration with the community. There are some opportunities to expand the park as well. So we'll look into that um, to bring it out more towards the street. So. So those are the options that will be looked into. If you're thinking it's approximately a million dollars for this project. For Fairview Park, um, again, this is a, a, a much larger project. It needs uh, improvements to the bluffs as well as the mesa. Uh, if you see the left picture uh, there, uh, top left, the bluffs are eroding. Um, so we are losing a lot of uh, space, a lot of land. So that needs to be stabilized and restored. And the mesa itself has um, a lot of restoration that needs to be done. Some areas have uh, mounds of uh, material that shouldn't be there, um, like concrete asphalt that needs to be removed. Uh, the area needs to be cleaned. Um, and and um, there are um, invasive species that should be removed and then and then followed by planting of uh, materials that are more native to the area. Again, this is a, a much larger project that needs to be evaluated. Um, we added wetlands as another project to this area. It's, this is not specifically mentioned in, uh, in Senator Min's um, uh, request, but we felt uh, something needs to be done for the wetlands uh, area. There are impacts that we need to mitigate. The previous design called for a recirculation pump as well as, uh, um, as, as a recirculation system as well as pumps to, and to improve the water quality in that area. And also to, to reduce uh, the complaints of mosquitoes and things like that. Again, this is something that has to be worked out more. Um, and, and if the projects that we listed that are required doesn't add up to $10 million, then we have options to do other improvements, and those are listed here. And, and they include uh, Tivinkle Amphitheater. Uh, this, is, this is within Tivinkle Park. It's, uh, it's a lesser known amenity um, within the park, and it could uh, use some improvements. The concrete needs, um, we, had, we need new concrete there, new se additional seating and lighting. To, to make it more usable by the community. Uh, we need to enhance the signage in Tivinkle Park. Um, the signage could be on, on Junipero, on Arlington, to point out to different um, amenities within the park and also within the park itself to, to provide wayfinding. Uh, tennis center, of course, needs improvements uh, in, in many areas, restrooms, shared structure, concrete, um, and also uh, there are improvements required within the courts as well. Bar Park Turf, uh, we brought to the council before to do some improvements to the turf areas. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's required. Uh, uh, Tivinkle Baseball Field, we do receive complaints. Uh, we talked about this even at the Friday um, uh, strategic planning session about the need for improvements to drainage, uh, netting and batting cages. Um, again, the 300,000 could be a low estimate. It could be higher, depending on um, whether we want to improve the infield and outfield uh, and all the all the fields. So it's 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 a good start, but there, it it could be a bigger project. Uh, the LED upgrades uh, right now uh, with with the with the Senator Min's money, we are identifying only the ball fields at at Tivinkle and Jack Hammett. But we have uh, the tennis center and bark park also that could use LED lighting. And then finally, um, and, and the pickleball courts, uh, it's to do new pickleball courts adjacent to the tennis center. And, and finally, the lakes. Uh, the lakes is a, is a much bigger issue that uh, we are, we are uh, facing right now. 
they are in need of repair. The shoreline is eroded. Uh, there is significant daily loss of water. Um, we are actually pumping water every day, new water into the lakes every day because of the, of the loss of water um, due to the damaged lake membrane. And then we have outdated pumping and water management system. So there is a design underway, actually. We have a design that's going uh, ongoing, and it should be done in the next uh, four or five months by the end of this fiscal year. And we are looking at adding, uh, improving the, fo uh, the floor, the, the lake shore, the flooring as well as the shoreline, um, new pump system, new water treatment system, and enhancing the landscaping around the lakes. With that, uh, I'll go back to the to this slide that talked about uh, the recommended allocations. So we just took the the different projects and and this is just an idea that that we grouped in different options. Uh, this is uh, this is just at staff level. We just came up with some some concept of how ten million dollars can be used. And the top uh, three lines are more or less set. That's the cost that we have for those three improvements. And then when it comes to Fairview Park and and the additional improvements within Tewinkle Park, there are some flexibility that can be uh, applied. So one thing is 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 that the ten million dollars is the bottom line number that we are trying to 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 match, and and if if so we just want to be flexible in how we allocate monies towards these other projects. And the reason why I just want to point out why a lot of these Tewinkle Park projects are shown is because when we um, or when application for when Senator Min asked for different projects uh, that, that can be proposed. Uh, I think T. Winkle was mentioned quite frequently, and a lot of these projects showed up in that list that went to uh, Senator Min. With that, um, staff is available to answer any questions you may have. Jeff first. Thank you. Um, so, Raj, I'm, ass I'm assuming, it's always a dangerous thing to say, um, that none of the proposed projects have a contingency associated with them. Is that right? Um, my Pratam Harlan, yeah, the, the top three, the, the top two projects at least, we have quotes from the vendors and we have 10% contingency on them. Okay. Um, but but the rest we don't have a design, so right. we have no way of applying any contingency. So, yeah. you know, making a, 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 again dangerously making the assumption that costs are only going to increase. I'm going to suggest that we maybe not look at ten million dollars as the starting point, but something less where we build in a contingency. Uh, and because I, my concern is coming back later, we're going to find we need more money for projects. We're, we won't have a plan for it. We're going to have to rely on general fund money. Um, if we can do everything within the $10 million, and maybe that means some shifting of priorities of projects, but I'd, I'd feel more comfortable with at least thinking about that. That's all I have at this very moment, though. <clears throat> Thank you. Good point. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. Andrea. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with that. I was trying to put together what my wish list would be, which you'll hear in a second. But I kept adding numbers because I know that no matter what we say, it's going to be more expensive than that. Um, can you go through um, which of these allocations already have CIP funds allocated to them also? Yes, Councilman Mar, uh, some of these projects, like um, Shalimar has uh, some allocation. And then um, there are I mean the others actually don't have any uh, specific allocations in this list. Not even the lakes renovation. Oh, oh, so sorry, the tennis center has some um, tennis center has some uh, uh, there is I need to find my budget. Sorry, I caught you off guard with that. Yeah, tennis center has about three hundred thousand dollars. okay. Um, the lakes is currently under design. Yeah, it has an allocation, but it's a design that's underway right now. Okay, it was just the design that's that a was design. allocated. Exactly. Okay. 
Um, so some of you might have seen this. I think our parks commissioner saw it in July of last year, but there was the equivalent of a facilities condition assessment done on the lakes. Um, and I, I pulled that up at the beginning of this meeting just to take a look and had to use a Google calculator to make sure I was getting the numbers right. So if I'm reading the report correctly, the second to last page says that the lakes are losing 5.73 uh, AF in water terms as acre feet, is that right? Acre feet per year, uh, which is the equivalent of 1.87 million gallons per year that is being lost from those lakes. Um, to put that in context, the average household uses 300 gallons per year. So almost 2 million gallons are leaching out of the lakes right now. And I'm assuming we're just helping re replenish the groundwater at this point. Like, should we be getting paid by the groundwater replenishment folks for, for all the money, <laughs> all the water we're giving them? I, I, or, or the fairgrounds is going to start sinking. I don't know, one or the other. But this is not sustainable. And so just in terms of raising this for my fellow council colleagues, um, this is not me hoarding resources in District 3. This is actually a, a crisis. Um, and it is a waste of money. It's also not environmentally where we want to be as a city. Um, the condition assessment that was done at the lakes is a, a really interesting read if you're a, a nerd like me, um, because it turns out there's actually some impressive ways to keep us from having some of the issues that we're having right now, both on the water loss side, but then also in terms of how the wildlife um, and the waterfowl managed to gunk up, for lack of a better word, um, all of the surrounding walkways. Um, there's berms, there's all kinds of natural features we can imply, uh, apply there that are, that are very cool, right? So that you've got a transition from lake to uh, sort of an interstitial space where you've got higher level planting and other things, and then you've got the walkway. So the ducks aren't just like finding their play to, place to poo on the walkway. So anyway, there's a lot of really cool things that we can do at T-Winkle that will both make them more aesthetically pleasing, pleasing but also more environmentally friendly. And so um, you know, my, my recommendation is to put at least a million dollars towards lake renovation. I think that could include signage and some of the other things that I've talked about. Um, wanting to, again, more aesthetically improve that area. If you have not been to T. Winkle on the average Saturday afternoon, you should, because it is by far the most happening park in Costa Mesa, hands down. There is always at least one quinceanera, sometimes a wedding, sometimes five or six birthday parties going on. Um, maybe also like bocce ball on the lawn and like 7,000 kids running around. So that that park gets a tremendous amount of use and to the extent that we can make sure that we're not also causing some kind of environmental disaster while we're at it, that would be ideal. Okay, so that's how I feel about the lakes. I did, off the top of your head, do you guys feel like my two million gallons per year was correct? I think I converted acre feet to gallons correctly. Our estimates are it's actually gone up to probably three quarters of an acre foot in the winter time per month oh. um, to about an acre and a half of acre foot per month in the summertime, depending on weather conditions and evaporation. So average that at one per month, that's double what I said. So that would be almost 4 million gallons of water. I believe their estimates were based on numbers from 1516 or 1617. I'm sorry, I don't recall another report in front of me, but they yeah. were older estimates. And so that has increased over the last few years. Okay. Thank you. Um, with regards to the Lions Park Cafe, I'm wondering, is that an opportunity for partnerships with private industry? Um, I know that, I don't necessarily want to name all of them, but I know that at least three coffee shops have approached me in the last couple of years asking if I knew a location that they could expand to. This seems like an ideal one. I don't know what the going rate of a TI is for somebody wanting to open a coffee shop, but I imagine that's probably a couple hundred thousand dollars. Is this a partnership opportunity with one of our wonderful Costa Mesa coffee shops that I spend way too much of my income on. Yeah, because of our, that's definitely an opportunity that we should uh, pursue, yes. Is, how do we do that? Is, that? is that an RFI we put out, like asking coffee shops if they're interested in partnering with us? Yes. Okay, good. On that, before we leave that, because I had that question, if I could, it's, is we have some required revenue sharing mm -hmm. with the county on that as part of our acceptance of this grant. What, what is that? Does anybody know? So um, 
Mayor um, Stevens, there, there, is a, there is an agreement that we had to execute with the county that required that any surplus revenues that generated from this would be shared um, with the library for the maintenance of the library. Oh, sweet. That would be really hard for a private business to then be, unless we did it like the golf course arrangement. It's it's the revenue it's the revenues that the city makes on that. It's not the it's uh, not the profit that the got it. Okay. operator makes. It's if the city gets revenue from the cafe, then that revenue has to be split with the okay with the library. I mean, I imagine we we don't we're not going to start hiring baristas, right? So we probably need a private partner in there anyway. Yes. Right, we would uh, issue the RFP for a concessionaire and also potential naming rights all in one, most likely. Cool, okay, thank you. Um, on this skate park expansion, uh, that's also, wasn't there also CIP money set aside for the skate, well, it was just the design of the skate park? That's correct, um, let me check on that. Um. Yeah, there was some design money set aside. I'm trying to find the project number. Okay. Oh yeah, it's about, um, we have $132,000 remaining on that one. So does $2 million get us a whole skate park expansion or would the city also have to match that? And the, our estimate is that we can, that's, that should be enough to do that project. Okay, and what's the time limit on this money? The county so money? County money has a deadline of uh, 2026 for implementation. Okay, so we've got a, we've got a minute. Yeah, I know the, the skate park community has been asking when, when they can start providing input. There's obviously some buzz about this happening. We've been talking about it for a long time. Um, so to the extent we could host a community meeting just to receive some at least conceptual designs or get folks to weigh in early, I think that would be really great. Um, generally supportive of all the LED lighting projects, as you might imagine. Um, I will say, in terms of the Bark Park turf improvements, we've sort of been down this road before. We've spent a lot of money. We end up in the same place where we're at. I, I think unless some substantive change happened, i.e. we're going to go dig up six feet of clay and replace it with something else, I, I don't know that that's um, where I want us to be spending our money right now. Um, on the tennis center, uh, I'm comfortable pulling together both the tennis center improvements and the LED lighting and adding a, a markup to Mayor Pro Tem's point and saying we probably need to spend about a million dollars on the tennis center. Um, if we do that, I'm less inclined to focus on the additional pickleball courts that are quite yet. I think that's important. I know people care about pickleball, but in the scheme of things, I'd rather fix the uh, degenerating lake um, and then put enough money towards the tender center that it makes a substantive difference, right? I, I think at this point we know, um, having gone through this whole tender center RFP process, that there needs to be some significant change, that there is room for significant improvement to the bathrooms, other things that we've heard about. Um, I, I'd rather, I've said this many times from the dais, but I'd rather do a few things really, really, really well than spread ourselves thin on aspirational projects um, and so if we're going to improve the tennis center, if we're going to get a new operator in there, we should just spend the money and do it right um, and not also try to do 17 other things. So the lakes and a big tennis center expansion, or excuse me, not expansion, improvements are my two priorities. Um, thank you. Thanks. Yes, Manny. Thanks, John. Um, you know, someone wise once said, more money, more problems, and that's what we're facing right now. I, I, I want to agree with, with Jeff's comment about not being too generous and spreading out the, the $10 million from, from Senator Min. Um, I, I like doing lists. I know we all have a lot of priorities, and I think it's easy to list out what I think priorities should be. I think for me, the lake renovations is key. Andrea hit it on the head pretty, pretty well. I mean, I think everyone in this room can say at one point they've taken a photo at the lakes at Tungle Park maybe for a quinceanera or for a wedding or prom pictures. It's, it's something that is a, it's a joy in the city. I want to heavily ex advocate for the baseball fields needing better drainage. Those are well-utilized sites in, in Costa Mesa. 
and I want to see us kind of like make sure that we're making sure those are are high quality standard. And I also want to prioritize the bark the bark park because that's an area where we see a lot of traffic. I do concur that turf improvements are probably going to be difficult given the clay, but I think LED lighting would be would be nice so that dogs can be there more more later in the evening. Um, when it when it comes to Fairview Park, I, I also want us to be very intentional as well. There's a lot of things we need to do in Fairview Park. We, we see it here with the restoration and the bluff stabilization. I want to see us kind of prioritize something and make sure it's done well. Um, that makes it a lot easier for us to know what the next step should be. And then to round back to District 4, because I know we do have allocated state allocated funding for both Shalomar and, and Kitchen Liable Park. For the, for the audience's clarity, what are the timelines for those two parks to be to be finished? So what's the timeline for the community engagement? What's the timeline for the bids going out? What's the timeline for completion? I'll take that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unless you, yeah. So um, on those two parks, where um, you've already talked to a consultant that will help with the community engagement, I think we're in the process of signing those contracts. We'll start with the community engagement, but we need design mm -hmm. right before we get into um, the other aspects of the project. For Ketchum Liebel, there's an opportunity to actually not just expand the park onto Victoria, but also see if there's a segment of Victoria that we could add combined with the CIP funds that we have so that it's a more integrated approach and gives us more opportunities there. But we'll need a good parks design consultant um, to do that. And so we're almost done with this contract. We can start having the community engagement on both of those sites and then sort of get that going. Yeah, so I'd say probably within the next 30, 45 days. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the reason why I ask is because I know a lot of people have, have heavy anticipation for those two projects. Um, particularly in my district, because they're the only two parks we have. So I do want to commend you for for trying to include more of the corridor on Victoria with with the money from San Juan Carpe Car Norris. Um, and then finally, my last comment is, um, I, I I feel a sense of a lot on this on this dais. Maybe, maybe I'm speaking for myself, but a lot of like pent up feelings because priorities aren't being prioritized, and there's a lot of sense of like. We're not doing enough. And I think what would be helpful for me going forward is getting a clear cut guideline of like what are the things we have to do every year. So I, I know in the last section I, I mentioned, you know, bringing back a master plan for the building rehabs, just so we're actually aware of what realistically can be accomplished for the CIPs. Um, and also getting like realistic expectations of like what we're actually prioritizing. I think the more opportunities we have to clearly lay out our priorities and clearly say what we prioritize, the better. I, I know we've been trying to do that, having these study sessions, and I commend staff and you, Lorianne, for doing that, but I think just for everyone's transparency, we need to have these frank discussions about like what we actually want to prioritize. So just to reiterate again, I, I think we definitely need to be prioritizing park expansions in a park port area like in my district with Shalomar and Leibolt. I definitely think we need to be putting um, the biggest priorities with, with with the Dave Min money, so that's basically the lighting and LEDs on, on the on both Hammett and Twinkle Park athletics. I think when you decide which of the Fairview Park things is going to be the most effective, in terms of a, a rehabilitation, and again I'll reiterate that I think that the, the three biggest priorities for the additional improvements, for me are the baseball field, the lakes, and the Bark Park. So thank you. Thanks. Um, Councilman, I did want to respond to um, the, I mean, the, the discussion tonight is to get that, is to get the priorities. And so that's what the whole intent of this conversation is. Um, regarding, you know, s some of the other conversations that we had in the earlier segment with Lou Davis Field and all that, we'll drill down on that. Um, the 14 million that we have is an enormous blessing and I don't want us to lose sight of that. And so if <laughs> it's an enormous amount of funding, there are more needs that exceed it, but this is an incredible problem to have. And I'm really glad that we were able to get these projects to 
uh, all of our representatives and made such a strong case that they were able to actually fund it. We've never seen anything close to this in terms of grants to the city ever in the city's history, not once ever. And so we're dealing with a lot of issues simultaneously. There is no facilities master plan. And so we've mentioned that as something, is a conversation I've had with you. Um, I just ask for your patience on this because the last thing I want is to have raised uh, a challenge and then uh, you get frustrated if that facilities master plan doesn't get done. We haven't hired anybody to do a facilities master plan. The city has never had a facilities master plan and we don't have the funding to fund a facilities master plan implementation. We'll have a consultant who will do an assessment of all 23 buildings and all the buildings that are not included in the 23, like the bathrooms, but I can tell you right now, Carol has no money to do anything about any of it. And so as we go through these budget processes and we raise these challenges, I just ask that uh, there be patience um, and sort of a long-term outlook on some of these because just like there's no ongoing fleet maintenance plan either, and we're working on that, and we're probably closer to that than we are on the facility side. It's something that is taking years for us to do, and we've been working on these, and we've been checking these problems off our list as we go, but it's a pretty long list between the technology and the facilities and everything else, and so, yeah, Luke Davis Field isn't open yet. It will be very soon, I can guarantee you that, because I don't ever wanna hear it again on the floor, so we'll, trust me that we will circle and we will handle that, but, um, it's a lot of needs and a lot of projects. Lauren? Yes, thank you. So I just kind of want to take off on some things that I'm hearing and the priorities. We have the wants, we have the needs, and then we have, we have to do this. Certain things we have to do, certain things we need to do certain things we want to do. One thing that I think is really important, I think we need to do this, we need to make sure that we take care of the west side. I don't think it's fair that we have a park that we just can't release to the community. I don't know what it would take, but if I was going to say what my priority is, as far as recreational services, and recreating for our community, for our kids, we need to open up the baseball field so that we can have soccer there and we can utilize it for whatever we want. It's, in, in my opinion, I almost look at it as a crime that we don't open the gate for these kids to play in. It's, it's just not, I just don't understand. Another thing um, that I'd like to present is when we do go to look at what we're gonna do with the baseball fields. We have community industry partners that are willing to partner with us. We have nonprofit organizations that have the funds that are willing to do whatever it takes to get these things going. So I wanna take that into consideration when we move forward with this, there's not a lot of people out there that are gonna say, hey, how much do you need? What can we do? They're ready with machinery, with money. They're ready to start digging. So. Uh, let's let's keep that in mind when when we move forward that we do have nonprofit organizations in our community that are ready and willing and um, Last but not least I know everybody wants to make everything they're doing a priority. I get it and There's only so many firsts that we can do first So in in moving forward with this I would say the path of least resistance currently would be looking at the west side and getting that open so that we can, uh, you know, let the kids play. The other part I know we're working on, I appreciate you. I appreciate what Jason's doing too. I know there's a lot of stress that comes along with this. It does not go unnoticed. So I just want to take a moment and say thank you very much. I appreciate your guys' hard work. Thank you. That's all. Arliss. Okay. Um, a few general questions. So um, fully agree with, with comments we've heard already related to sort of planning to come in under 10 million knowing um, cost increase. Um, do, do the cost estimates include project management? Because I know that was one of the things we've talked about, not having enough 
staff capacity to manage these projects? Is that built into these estimates or not? So, uh, <clears throat> Cousin Reynolds, uh, as we don't have a design yet, I don't know exactly what it takes to do the construction and the and the and the management. But I did check with the granting authority agency, and they said uh, those are eligible costs to be reimbursed by the grant. So they are eligible to be reimbursed. We just need to make sure that, um, as as others mentioned, I think it's it's good to have fewer projects that we know we can do, and then um, build in those kind of costs so that uh, so that it can be done. Yeah, I, I think that would be um, an important strategy as we um, sort of fine tune and figure out what this this allocation looks like is to you know as much as possible leverage the opportunity to also hire project management support to keep our staff free to address everything we talked about you know between five and seven um and then uh, uh, you you just mentioned one of my other thoughts um which is i'm i'm assuming that fewer projects will be sort of cheaper, right, because our staff and administrative services won't be spread across multiple projects. So I, I think fewer large projects makes um, makes sense. Um, I had a couple of questions related to the, the Shalimar project. So I know we had an existing CIP, um, but I didn't see that, that cost. How much was in the existing CIP for Shalimar Park expansion? I know we have a million dollars for the expansion, which is a different project than the Shalimar Park improvements. So, um, so the total for Shalimar is at least two million in state grants plus our previously approved yeah. CIP. So yeah, we have two hundred fifty thousand dollars in Shalimar Park improvements, and then and then we have a million dollars for expansion, which could be. Okay. Pr um, property acquisition, things like that to expand the park. It's it's not talking talk about improvements, but expansion. Got it. Okay, so the total <clears throat> for Shalimar is only $1.25 million. Yeah, if you assume the $1 million from Senator Min's money and yep. the $250,000. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I would be, um, and that includes design, the, the appropriate yes. engagement, design, construction. Yeah, I would be, um, uh, I think we should include that amount. Um, one thing we haven't seen yet, but, but is... Um, I saw a previous version five years ago in a previous life with a parks commissioner hat on of our um, park equity map as part of the open space master plan. I think we're gonna see that in a month or two. And, and there's a really important map on that plan that shows um, where there is uh, green space, of course, in the city. Um, and I think we added an analysis which is intended to show, right, sort of green space per population, right? And that just sort of exacerbates the park deficit in, in certain areas of our community. and so. Um, I think the expansion part of the Shalimar project is really important because um, it's a tiny park in a dense area um, where there's not a lot of other park space nearby. And I don't, it, 1.25 million just doesn't sound like enough to do a, an expansion. Um, so I'd be interested in adding more, more funds there. Um, obviously I agree with my colleagues who've talked about um, uh, supporting park space on the west side. Um, I won't talk about Luke Davis again because it sounds like that, that's gotten through. Um, but I, you know, I think that this idea of looking through um, fences at green space that you can't access, right, also applies to the kids and families who live between Victoria and Joanne, who are looking through an entire chain link fence at a, I don't know how many acre golf course that they can't access, right? And so I think we should be in the future, um, because we don't have funds here, but we should be looking at how to make some of that space more accessible to our community as well. Um, okay, um, on the Lions Park Cafe, I know this is sort of a allocated project. We don't have um, much discretion. Um, what I, I, I like the idea of a, a partnership with one of our local businesses. I don't want to miss the opportunity to really be creative with um, that space too. And so um, what I wouldn't want to see is, um, you know, a um, sort of a, a, a single product cafe that's only programmed, you know, from eight to five or something. I think this, um, I'd like to see, uh, and I'll, I'll try to find some models as examples, but I, I'd really like to see um, us look into opportunities to use that as a way to really activate the space in, in interesting ways, incorporating some of our um, arts ideas, right? How can that be a flex space that, you know, maybe has coffee in the morning and sandwiches during the day and, you know, churros at night or something like that. So really being creative with the space to, um, uh, to create a, an immunity and continue to activate that, that center um, throughout the day. 
uh, within the $1.2 million that we got. Not advocating for more there. Um, related to Fairview Park, um, <laughs> I know, I think if we used all the money on the bluff repairs and, and Mesa restoration, it sounds like that wouldn't even uh, be enough. Obviously, I think those, um, those projects are necessary. I think it was three or four years ago we had to do emergency bluff repair. We don't wanna, um, we don't wanna have to do that. Um, we, we, we have to move forward on those projects, so um, you know, a, a, enough funds to do a, a really good job and probably a little more knowing that, that that's money we're gonna have to spend in the next few years anyways to um, address restoration requirements um, and implement our master plan that we've, we've just started. Um, we got some commentary on the, the circulation pump piece um, and, and a recommendation for a, a, a much cheaper short-term improvement. I think we should really look at that. Um, I, don't, I don't want any controversy associated with, with the, these grant monies. Um, and so it sounds like there's um, uh, maybe a, sh a cheaper short-term solution on the, the pump piece. I think that's worth looking into and considering. Um, maybe moving some more of those those funds into the um, bluff and mesa restoration. Um, I think the the recommendation we got in one of the po uh, public comments for enhanced signage, fencing, and trails, I think, is a, a really good idea, um, and really complementary to the restoration efforts. Right, one of the problems we have a lot of erosion issues is people and and mesa issues is people are going off trail, and so it makes sense to pair restoration with signage and fencing to make sure that people are walking um, and biking where they should be. Um, so those are all sort of within the, the, the projects that we have to do. Um, related to some of the other projects, I fully agree with the um, supporting the lake renovations at Tewinkle. Um, sounds like there's some important cost savings there as well. Are we paying, do we like buy the water to replenish the links too? Okay, so I had asked, I had sent a quest few questions ahead of time asking for like which projects will have a payback and that wasn't listed. <laughs> and so <laughs> that was a, um, a glaring miss, but I'm glad um, folks have caught it and will, um, that it sounds like that just needs to be done as just smart to be done. Um, and then would there be cost savings? So we, we, we need to do the LED projects at Jack Hammett and Tewinkle um, are there cost savings if we just do like this big package of LED lighting also at the tennis center and bark park at the same time? There may be uh, some cost savings by combining projects and, and doing them together. Um, we need to look into that. Okay. Uh, we got some quotes from the vendor, but those are for individual, worth individual looking projects. Into, you know, there's gonna be costs, sort of annual operational cost savings to, um, to do those projects. If there's also cost savings to bundle them, um, I think that's worth, worth looking into. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've already said I think the Shalimar funds should be increased. Um, I think, you know, the, we're gonna have to spend money on, on Fairview Park restoration anyways, so I, I think that should be increased. Um, so I wouldn't, I, I'd lean away from any of the other projects other than, than what I've described. Um, and I, I wanna make one other point. I think it's really important that these state funds be used on amenities that are accessible to everyone in the public. So um, I would be very against using them um, for amenities, for example, in the tennis center, which you have to pay to use. I think it's really important that these funds be used for, for free, publicly accessible amenities. Thank you. All right. My notes are not very um, well laid out, so I might bounce around here a little bit. All right, so I'm going to have, let us see if our city attorney can can earn his money here. Okay, are you ready, Baron? Yes. Okay, so we uh, we have these on our pay on our, on our the item that's displayed number seven slide seven. We have these bolded categories, and these are the items that <clears throat> um, our senator has basically said these are the things that he really wants to do, okay? And and it, there's some restrictions. And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but so, so a couple questions related to that is, number one, um, how entrenched is that? In other words, could we go back after we go through the process with our PACS commission and with our council, could we go back to him and have him revisit that or is that 
set in stone because of some representation that was made by the senator in, in order to obtain these funds. That's point number one. And point number two, which is more of a legal question, is we one thing we we know pretty much about uh, S Senator Dave Min is that Senator Dave Min won't be Senator Dave Min for very long. Okay, and uh, so w what if we didn't do these uh, that are that are listed in bold and we chose a different priority? What what is the sanction enforcement? What if we just said, you know, thank you very much and thank you for the money, but we would prefer to put an amphitheater at, uh, hypothetically, at, at, at T. Winkle Park to fixing the bluffs or putting LED lines? I mean, hy hypothetically, what would happen? Mr. Stevens, if I can start and maybe uh, Ben can chime in because you're going to let him off the hook that easily. Just just so that do you need do you need do you, do you need his help, Baron? You need his help. Go ahead, go ahead. You guys collaborate. Yeah, exactly. Just want to point out uh, the way the money is allocated is through the state budget. Okay. So in the state budget, there are there is a specific line item language that lists these four sites. I get it. That's what I want to point out. Yes. With that, I'll leave it for Baron to. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Baron. <laughs> I, I was going to sum it Show up your stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Working? Okay. Uh, I was going to sum it up by saying, you know, words are free, so yeah, you can ask, but there is an extensive process by which the money does get granted, and it's, if they're going to make changes, it's just as possible that they would take it away completely. So there's always a risk there, and it, the restrictions are typically part of the grant itself. Got it. Okay. I just thought I'd ask. I did not know. All right. So, so then... Um, Okay, one just a comment. All these items that are, we're talking about doing to Fairview Park, and I'm pretty sure that they fall within the uh, an exception to AA. But I think we got to be just crystal clear and, and and careful about that, and then we bring it back to the council for whatever findings are necessary, so we are in compliance with AA. And we went through that, I remember, a number of years ago where we had certain items, that we, projects we were going to do, and we, very, we had to go back to the language of AA to make sure that there was compliance. So I think it's important for us to do that. I'm going to throw out a couple of additional projects for us to consider uh, and uh, in the mix and for the PACs commissioners to consider. One is the fly field. Okay, it's at Fairview Park. Uh, I happen to know because I get a draft of the agenda that that's something that we could very well be considering at our next meeting. Okay, so um, something to think about before this comes back is whether to add another item for, for our consideration and prioritization before we pull the trigger, and that is doing something with the fly field at Fairview Park. The other one, as long as I, we're on that in that vein, is um, Lorianne encouraged us to think long term, okay? And I'm going to think long term here. I have a moonshot, okay? My moonshot is that we have a a baseball complex, a little league baseball complex, and I've talked about it with Jason. We've met about it, Raja. And I think Lauren was at that meeting too, maybe, I can't remember. But the idea is to create multi-use fields that will accommodate baseball at the back part of Jack Hammett so that we could, and have lighted fields, lighted baseball fields, so we could have a full, we, we now have in our Little League, if you can believe this, 610 players. We, we now have one of the strongest Little Leagues in District 62. And we could be a force, but we haven't invested in that sport, or softball even for that matter, like, for example, Fountain Valley has. So, so now our facilities are lagging what the community is developing through their own leadership and the participation of the children. So um, maybe that saves me from my 
pejorative comments about organized sports earlier. Um, uh, okay, what else do I have? With respect to the some of these items that are on the list, some thoughts. F baseball field drainage, I think, is very important. Um, I tend to ag definitely agree with what I think I heard Andrea say, which is to not prioritize pickleball, particularly not at the tennis center. And that goes back to the comment I made, I think it was at our meeting the other day, that I that my vision, and I think it would be better to decentralize pickleball. I like pickleball, but I'd like to see it throughout the city. And also, and so have that tennis center be, for the most part, exclusively a tennis center. Um, with respect, nobody has really talked about this idea of the uh, amphitheater. And I think that that could be a, a really wonderful thing and a community in the city of the arts. It could be a wonderful thing. However, I wouldn't prioritize it for use of the Dave Min money for a couple reasons. Number one is I think it's a, 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 it would be an excellent use of our cannabis tax money for arts. And as God is my witness, we will have that money someday and soon, and it will be real, and it can be used for those purposes. And that was exactly the vision, is to elevate arts by using that fund. In addition to that, somebody's going to need to program that facility if it comes out like I think it could. And so, you know, you have Sagerstrom uh, Center of the Arts, which has programming that could do like Shakespeare in the Park, various concerts. They have a lot of children's stuff that they do there. Also, the Newport Mesa Unified School District. So I think there are a lot of funding sources for that project. So. Uh, that's the only reason. I would prioritize it over many of these projects just in terms of what I think are important, but I would have it a low priority for use of the MIN money. Um, what else do I have? Uh, oh, regarding the baseball, getting back to that, so why did I bring that up? Um, I don't expect that we're going to do, uh, obviously, you know, do a baseball complex, that would be a lot of money. But what I think would be good is just, you know, every uh, long journey begins with a small step. And so if we could allocate some of this money to design, like I'm just saying, let's say hypothetically we were able to say, we're gonna take $50,000 of the min money. We're gonna combine it with 50,000, I'm just making these numbers up just for, for, for reference and for proportion. And we're gonna combine it with $50,000 that we get from Costa Mesa United and Costa Mesa Little League and use that $100,000 to create a design for a project that might not get built until 2028, but you gotta start somewhere. Um, and I, I think, I definitely agree that uh, with, um, many people who said that Tewinkle Lakes renovation is a high priority. But also I think upgrading restrooms at all these facilities is a high priority. Um, you know, the restrooms are, you know, whatever. I don't want to say what's wrong with the restrooms. We all know what's wrong with the restrooms. They were built ages ago. They're dark. They've got, they're borderline dangerous. They're not functional. And I think that that should be something on our list is to upgrade the rest, restrooms at, 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 all the, at all these, well, you know what, maybe not as much at Jack Hammett because Jack Hammett, I think, has got pretty good restrooms, but the rest of them um, could, could use some tender, loving care. I think that's all I have. Just give me a second. Mr. Mayor. Oh, just let me just make sure I've covered my points. Yeah, I'm done. Yes. 
I, yeah, I was I was remiss. I, I had it written down, but I I also wanted to make sure I voiced voiced my support for the ball field drainage netting batting cage improvements. You and I have talked about that separately, Raja, but I wanted that to be on the record. Um, and then also I realized earlier I just jumped into my questions and comments right away and I didn't say anything. But um, the, the incredible track record that this department has, and thank you so much. A, a responsiveness, I, I like that. The mayor pro tem mentioned that, and it's totally. It's 100% true. This is like the most responsive department. Um, I get tagged in a lot of really random things on social media, and many of them involve the Public Works Department, and I text Raja way too much, but you always text me back, so um, thanks for your entire team for what they do. Also, the other thing what, but I, I want but I wanna make sure is we, that we thank and pay homage to Senator Min Supervisor Foley He's and Assembly Member uh, Cotty Pichinoris, without whom we would not have these problems of allocating right. this fund. Despite the fact you're calling for Dave Min's political demise. No, I'm just saying, as a matter of just public record, yes. we all know he's I running mean, for Congress, right? I right. mean, anyway, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I wish he'd be senator for a long time, but you can only hold one office. Yes. Go ahead. All right. So. Uh, I'm glad I heard everybody else's comments. I jumped in with the contingency piece because I hope that would sort of set the stage for some some parameters for budgeting. Um, so my my approach to the Dave Min money, uh, may he live long and prosper in his position, um, is uh, to, to start with these are one-time investments. I mean, it's rare to have this kind of opportunity, uh, so we really do want to capitalize on it. And to my mind, we should be adding as much value as possible to our infrastructure. Um, that's always the hardest thing to fund. Um, so uh, if we start with the, the farm lighting, T. Winkle lighting, and Shalimar is kind of, I think we all agree, stable. That, to my mind, is about 2.75 million we've already allocated. Um, I agree uh, the tennis center really needs some significant improvements. And to my mind, that's in the 750 to million dollar range. I agree with the lake improvements. It seems like we, we desperately need to do that because we will forever have maintenance issues, which are just going to cost us in the long term. Um, and in the tennis center, I would include the bark park lighting as well. Um, if you have a million dollar contingency, we've got a total of nine really towards projects that leaves roughly four and a quarter for Fairview Park. Um, and the Mesa restoration and bluff stabilization and restoration seem to be the most consistent uh, projects I am, and, and necessary ones. I'm not fully sold on the wetlands improvements at the moment. I think it's a little premature. Um, I read Mr. D'Augusto's um, memo. I agree with a lot that's in there. I'd actually like our Fairview Park Committee to weigh in on this. These are you know, the people we, we've appointed to advise us. Um, we may not ultimately agree as to what those priorities are, but I think it's worth getting that input. Um, and lastly, when I talk about infrastructure too, I think it's um, vital that we um, kind of leverage our revenue generating facilities as well. Um, the tennis center and, and the uh, golf course, for example, um, because if we can per, uh, make those improvements, enhance those facilities, presumably get more revenue in the long term, that actually will support uh, other facility improvements and programs that we have. We have limited options in how we actually generate revenue from our facilities, and I want to make sure that we kind of keep that top of mind. Um, you know, the, the tennis center in particular uh, does need improvement. We've heard that from the people who were here back when we were talking about the RFP, um, and I think it would be a good good faith effort to make those improvements too, not just for the community, but um, also for other people who come and use that facility. Well said. Anybody else? All right, are we gonna adjourn by eight o'clock, you think? Three minutes, all right. I don't think I can, can vamp for three minutes. I think we're gonna make it. Everybody's good? Everybody said what they needed to say? You thought the over-under was eight? Eight, no, I, I said I'd get out, out of here by seven, so I'm way over. Yeah. Okay, all right, so, um, all right, thank you very much. Thank you to the department, thank you to the public, thank you to the great comments by staff and by the council. And uh, PACS, 
Uh, you're on the clock. The ball's in your court. 